Healthcare Advocates Office puts a decent amount of energy into soliciting, encouraging Vermonters to comment in the rate review process. We don't put that same effort into the hospital budget process for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them being that we've just been out there doing it a month ago, and it seems hard to go back to people. Um, and one of them is uh, sort of the recognition of 14 hospitals in 14 different communities is, is more difficult to go out and say, hey, come comment. Um, but I think everyone here knows that the comments that the board received during the hospital budget process, I'm sorry, that the, that, that the board received during the rate review process apply to this process just as much. Um, nobody here would, uh, uh, everyone here I think recognizes that um, a significant factor, maybe the most significant factor in the rate review process is the is provider billing, is the cost uh, that providers, the, the rates that providers charge. So I want to link them and encourage you to think about all of the all of the comments that came to you during the rate review process as applying here just as much. Um, I think we have an opportunity today, this year, to turn the page on how we review hospital budgets. Um, I'm, we are really encouraged by the work of Sarah Lindbergh and the hospital budget team, uh, taking a deep look at uh, Vermont's revenue and costs and compare them to national um, and regional benchmarks. Um, but data is not good in and of itself. Um, we're, we're hoping that, uh, that the collection of this data um, uh, um, helps the board make uh, 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 recognize the, the real cost to Vermonters. Um, the, we encourage the board not to take a one size fits all approach to hospital budgets and carefully examine what each hospital has presented and submitted. Some hospitals have taken difficult and courageous steps on their own to cut costs and improve patient financial assistance policies, uh, but some have not. Um, we believe that uh, many hospitals will not make these decisions to cut costs unless the board uh, takes action. Uh, what we hope for and what I think Vermonters need is an evidence-based regulation that not only looks at hospitals, uh, at, at revenues, but also at costs. The evidence that Vermont hospitals need to be required to substantially cut costs is clear to us. Um, with that, I think I will close and say thank you again uh, to the board um, and to all of the hospitals. I know this is a difficult task in front of you and we look forward to participating. Thank you. Um, can somebody just give me a hands up so they can hear me? My audio switched. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> Um, are there any board members questions or comments for Mr. Fisher, or Mr. Del Treco? Um, I, I had a couple quick ones, if that's okay. Uh, first, um, and maybe this will be actually in the substantive budget review itself, but there's a couple things I struggle with as a regulator or a new regulator, I should say. And one is if a hospital is not controlling costs well, but needs the money, should the board provide it the money? So for example, huge disparity in traveler costs between some hospitals in Vermont. Some hospitals did better with that, some didn't do as well. And some of it, not all of it, but some of it could be attributed to decisions that were made. So should the board give all situations if it's found that the hospitals didn't do as well as potentially they could have? You know what I mean? So it's a bit of a catch-22. Either we say no, in which case you don't get the money that is needed for the care, but it sort of bails out or subsidizes a decision that, that had a negative consequence for Vermonters. And I was curious on both of your views on that kind of situation. We might be both waiting for each other to go first. Um, I, I think that hospitals are always going to know better um, the details of their budgets. And I think that there's some risk uh, if the board attempts to 
micromanaged specific areas of spending that um, uh, that would be very difficult for the board to actually do. Um, on the other hand, the board's role, in our view, is to put real pressure on hospitals to say, um, you know, I'm sorry, the, the pressures on the community, the pressures on costs are too much. Uh, you're the experts in knowing how to do it. Come back to us with a corrective, with a plan on how to actually accomplish um, the holding the line on increased spending. I don't know if that helps, but I think that's the frame that I approach. I would approach it. So thanks, uh, Mike. I was having a hard time clicking off my mute. Um, so I, I think there's um, varying reasons why organizations are are successful uh, in doing certain things and, and you use the traveler example. Uh, some organizations have uh, different staff makeup, their uh, services are different and they require different specialties and skills. Uh, the thing to to note here is that we're in a very we're in a national marketplace for for labor now. Um, there are there are many challenges. So so the opportunities uh, may look different at each organization. So I think it's a hospital by hospital uh, discussion. Uh, in the affordability efficiency space, I think the the one thing to uh, note in your question, uh, Chair Foster, is the the simple reality of um, you know people will will go and and get their care whether it's in Vermont or out of Vermont. Uh, and we would have to evaluate and, and and recognize that people go out of the state, that that expense still exists. Um, so to keep funding within the state, to keep resources within the state, uh, would be my um, it'd be it, that would be a pr priority of mine. It might may not may not be of the boards, but I think to keep those those services and funding in the state is something that would be desirable. Uh, keeping care local is very important, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. Um, you know, we are the most rural state in the nation. Transportation is a huge problem, um, whether it's public transportation or frankly, uh, individuals not having the ability to have a reliable car or, um, or, or other means of transportation is, is clearly a challenge. Um, so these are things that I would be uh, thinking about as I evaluate decisions. Um, I too uh, think that there's um, some opportunity uh, to create and move forward some um, understanding of measures. I I do worry a little bit about uh, measures that haven't been vetted uh, uh, to date and, and not lack of understanding about what the data looks like. Um, but I do know, as I mentioned in my remarks, that we are at a pivotal moment. Um, the decisions we make here today uh, the decisions you make, I don't make any decisions in this process. The decisions that you make will have uh, significant effects um, on organizations. So thank you. I think I think you're really right. I read your letter that you submitted last night. And I thank you for doing that because I think it helps frame some of our thinking on this from from that point of view. And one of the things that stuck out was that there was um, some discussion of admin costs and discussion of um, uh, reform costs and regulatory costs. Um, but I presume that those aren't the only, if, the, if it is found that the hospitals have excessive admin costs compared to peers, those wouldn't be the only reasons I presume. And I guess the question is, is there any sort of calculation of how much of those costs um, are contributing to the admin costs? Um, so, so I happen to um, have had the fortunate or unfortunate um, ability to submit many cost reports in my life um, and organizations across the country submit those costs differently. There's a whole host of um, activities uh, that happened uh, within that space. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get too geeky here, but, you know, the cost report, the first 20 some odd lines are our overhead. Um, they include things like medical records. They include things like uh, depreciation uh, and investments in uh, information technology specific to electronic medical records. They include things like direct patient care for pharmacy and lab. It's a very interesting uh, administrative uh, number. 
when you look at the only line item, I think it's line five or six, I, you know, I, it's been a while. Um, that is the administrative cost, the direct admin cost in those organizations. So uh, it matters how the comparison points to those other organizations. It matters uh, if those organizations have um, uh, own and, uh, and employ physicians. Um, there, are, there are many details when we're looking at uh, comparative points. Uh, so, so apples to apples, apples to oranges is important to to think about. So, um, again, I I would say carefully look at those things and and ask those questions. Um, but it's not always uh, what meets the eye. And then on the reform costs that are referenced in the letter, I think of reform as a chance to for hospitals and others to to do better financially, not to do worse. But it seemed to be cited as something that was a cost in the admin, which might explain higher admin costs. Um, was your reference to the reform costs indicating that net it costs hospitals more money than they save? So when you're looking at administrative costs directly, there are certain things that when you when that we have in the state of Vermont that other organizations um, around the country don't have. We have investments in one care. We have investments um, in your organization. Uh, we have investments in uh, pr uh, provider tax that are, you know, well above, um, you know, we're at six percent of our net patient service revenues. Other states are well below uh, that those amounts. So, so I think that was the intent of that. Uh, that was the intent of that discussion, uh, Chair Foster. So what I was trying to get at, so I think of one care and the amount of risk they take and then the amount of money they can make if they hit the total cost of care and the money can go through the participating hospitals as a benefit, right? Like additional money because the total cost of care is set fairly high. And if you're below, which I think one care generally is for Medicare, you're saving. So I didn't view reform as a cost, saw it sort of as an opportunity to, to do better financially. And when I read the letter, I thought it was indicating that it was a cost and not a net positive. And I don't know the answer to it. So I was curious if you view it as a net negative financially to the hospitals or a net positive. Uh, the math probably looks different at each organization. I, I don't know the, the specifics of that math, but, but the administrative piece, if you're looking at administrative comparisons, the net of what we're talking about doesn't matter. Um, we're looking at admin, admin to admin. Um, so when we, yeah, so that that that's how I would think about that. When you're looking at it in total, um, it, I'm sure it varies by organization if there's a benefit or a loss. I see. So if it's an admin cost, it's an admin cost, and whether or not there's revenue from it, that might be somewhere else and not netted out in the admin cost. Correct. Got it. Um, last question, um, which is something I struggle with. We get a lot of comment and information from patients, businesses, um, Vermonters about the cost of health care, and they have been rising pretty significantly. I think it's 45 to 80 percent-ish for the qualified health plans for the last five or six years, which is a lot. And we know the hospitals have financial needs. We understand that. We recognize that. We recognize they need to be financially strong. The other set of letters we get and communications we get are from all the non-hospitals, the independent primary care, the substance abuse, the mental health, the long-term care. And in my view, those are very critical to helping, helping the system, patients, and hospital finances, right? Those are very important to help the hospital's financial burden, that there's good infrastructure of that around the hospitals. And some of the feedback we've been getting is that the hospitals are getting um, higher rates than all of those others. And so when we look at these hospital budgets, um, we can't look at them in a vacuum. We have to look at the whole system. And I was curious your thoughts on how we should balance the fact that hospitals have serious financial need right now. But then we're also hearing from patients and Mr. Fisher's point that people are getting priced out of insurance or buying down the kind of insurance they have or avoiding care altogether. And then also all these non-hospitals are providing information that they need increased rates and that when we give it to hospitals, it's, it's impacting their ability to, to be solvent themselves. And in your view, how should we think of that and balance that in this process? Yeah, first I'd say, um, you know, based on the household surveys, 
it looks like the burden um, on hospital debt is going down year over year. Um, not to say that affordability isn't a challenge, but we're moving in the right direction. Secondly, under the federal tax credit, um, no one should be paying more to more than nine ish percent um, of their income towards those in pre premiums that that you've mentioned. Um, and then there's additional subsidies if if there are there are challenges. So um, you know clearly we uh, clearly I and my members understand the challenge of affordability. And and when we build when these budgets are built, um, there's many analytical analysis that goes on about operational efficiency. Um, it's no surprise that we all belong to organizations to drive down our supply costs. It should be of no surprise that uh, the position control and FTE management happens daily. And that includes uh, nursing shifts, that includes um, filling vacant positions, that includes evaluating and, and, and creating appropriate targets um, uh, for uh, um, you know, FTEs and finance, FTEs and uh, in those administrative areas. So, um, you know, there's many variables and, and components uh, in this conversation. Um, and I would say, again, our hospitals recognize deeply the affordability challenge. And I would go back to saying that if we drive patients out of Vermont um, through this, this process and decision making, we certainly will still bear the cost and it may even be higher. That's a little, that's uncertain, but the cost will still exist. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, um, I, I read the health, household health insurance survey to say something a little bit different from my perspective. Um, I think that the, uh, the steady trend in increased um, under insurance is indisputable. I, I don't know of anybody who thinks medical debt is less of a problem today than it was in recent years. Um, we hear clearly from Vermonters that they choose not to follow medical advice because they have to make an economic decision, not a healthcare decision. And so all of the um, the, the sort of the concerns from the hospitals of what happens if um, if they can't provide the care already exists for Vermonters who are making the choice of who are, who are dealing on the ground today with how do I get the care I need or my loved one needs and be able to afford the out-of-pocket costs or the, the costs. Um, so, you know, and then I'll also, I'll also add, um, hospitals make a lot of strategic decisions. The board doesn't, don't, doesn't make strategic decisions, um, you know, you know what investments to make, uh, transfers to affiliates. There are major decisions that hospitals make that I think the board can evaluate. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think that's, that's a place where we turn to as we look at many of the hospital budgets. I don't doubt, I know that, that hospitals are, are thinking about access and therefore affordability. Um, um, but they don't see it from the lens. Well, I don't think they see it from the lens that I see it from when I hear when I'm hearing from people who who can't get in to get care. So that's the crux of what I'm struggling with is to me, there's almost three constituents, right? There's Vermonters who are saying they can't afford to get care and they're telling me they can't afford to have insurance. And then the such one can't afford care. Then there's the non-hospitals who are saying that they can't afford to provide the care. And then there's the hospitals saying they can't afford to provide the care. And so the, oh. I know it's the crux of the job. And my question is, I guess, really both of you is how do you see our role in, should we be considering those three sets? And how do you see that balance working here? Because I do not dispute or disagree that the hospitals are in financial difficulties. But then there's the other two set, and that's what I'm trying to balance in my head as we start this process. So, so uh, Chair Foster, I would say, you know, 98% um, of Vermonters have insurance. It might not be the best insurance, but 98% of Vermonters have insurance. Um, we worked with Mike Fisher and the HCA team to pass a charity care bill last year. Um, I believe it's Act 
119. Um, and that these are all efforts in the policy space to address this affordability challenge. In addition, um, we will work with any patient anywhere at any time to make sure that they get the care they need. We have charity care people. We have people that help uh, individuals get enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, we make sure that they're on the Medicaid rolls when they need to be. We make we help them enroll in uh, the marketplace where appropriate. Um, and if there is a shortfall in their care and coverage, our charity care policies um, are designed to 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 make up that difference. Does it work perfectly every single time? Uh, is it sufficient to the hundred percent? Probably not. But um, we are we are maximizing that opportunity every day uh, because we understand and we care for the communities we serve. Um, the, this notion that um, you know it's ter it's it's not great for me to hear that um, individuals are delaying or postponing care. Um, that should never happen. Um, Michael Fisher, if you have a list of those people, let's get them, let's get them going and, and let's stop saying there's a list and let's move it forward. Um, because to say there's a list and, and to say that there's these challenges without addressing them um, at, the, at the local hospitals um, is a problem and we can solve that literally today. Um, so, uh, that's how I would respond to that. And I know the challenge that you have in balancing these hospital budgets, affordability and efficiency um, within these organizations is a deep and challenging job. Um, I sit here today saying that I spent a lot of time with our hospitals in this budget process. Their hospital boards reviewed these these um, budgets and they and they are community members. They understand the pressures of each community and the affordability challenges. So I can sit here with a great degree of certainty and say, this is this is needs based stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, if there are individuals that need our help today, uh, let's get that going. I'd rather do that than this than this job right here today that, that we're talking about. And I'll just and what about go ahead, go ahead Mike. One one final thing, maybe for me at the moment is uh, I think we're here in the public comments. Uh, the expression of people who feel like they um, uh, they have to make an ac economic decision instead of a public a, uh, a healthcare decision. But I think I also want to I want to steer steer back to the chair's original question. I I, I guess I want to say thank you for bringing another seat to the table of the healthcare providers that are not immediately in front of you here, or actually not in front of you at all, because you don't regulate them. And to ask the question, what is the relationship between your decisions on commercial rates at the hospitals? What is what is what impact does that have on the availability of a reasonable rate for those non-regulated providers? In other words, does your regulation of hospitals assure that they will get the money uh, that they need, and therefore? Make it harder for the rest of the healthcare industry. It's, it's uh, you know to get its appropriate funding. It's a great question and one that I don't think we have an easy. There's no easy answer to. You don't regulate them, um, but I think it's a it's a key dynamic that I think we see staring in front of us and and one that is important to bring to this table. Yeah, I think in the when we reconsidered the VAS request on the hospital budget guidance, there was a really huge volume of letters suggesting or indicating that they felt that if we gave the hospitals the requested rates, that they would get a fraction or zero or one or two percent, and that that was having a negative impact. And so I, I am curious how we should be thinking of that as we head into this process from from VAS and the hospitals' perspective. I would say there are no guarantees. Um, we aren't guaranteed a rate increase through this budget hearing process. Um, in your in your orders, um, you speak to caps and negotiations. Um, so there are no guarantees. I, I think you've addressed that. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate the dialogue and, and your perspectives on these issues because I think they are, to me anyway, as one board member, they're sort of the real rub of all this and the real challenge that we have. And I appreciate you both being respectful that that is not an easy 
thing to job to balance for us. So thank you for your thoughts and uh, thank you understanding understanding that difficulty we have. Can, can I follow up on one one question that you had asked, Chair Foster? Uh, the, the first question, the first question, the way I understood the question, I think Chair Foster was asking. Um, and I'll switch to a hypothetical non-Vermont situation. So I think because Mr. Deltreco is, I think, you know, the representative of Vermont hospitals, it puts you in a bit of a challenge to answer the question without um, sort of considering an individual case. But if if one was to hypothetically, situ you, know, say, you know, say, okay, we were presented data that a particular hospital is struggling with performance in, a, in an area, say, managing expense growth, and uh, and they're asking for a substantial increase in a, commercial rate increase. Um, what are some suggestions you would have the board consider as opposed to, we can discuss the validity of the data, but say hypothetically, we've, we've come to the conclusion that the data trend is valid enough to be concerned about expense management within this organization, but the rate that they're asking for is high. How should the board consider that from your view? Should the board continue to grant high rates with a hospital that's had continued expense growth management over time? Or should the board consider decreasing those rates to try to encourage the hospital to become a more sustainable organization over time? Or is there a third option that you would suggest to us to consider? Sure, sure. Um, I'll leverage some of my experience in um, the financing area and and going uh, uh, forward to ask uh, you know uh, 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 for borrowing money. There's a set of financial metrics. Uh, those metrics are fluid, uh, and those rating agencies and those places where you're borrowing money from look at those metrics. And if you're underperforming in some and overperforming in others, there's a set of questions that go with that. Why? What is your uh, performance uh, uh, correction? At, you know, what's your corrective action plan on performance to improve uh, some numbers? But remember that those numbers are not static. They all move for certain reasons at certain times. So I do think there's a third option. And I think that third option is having that conversation uh, with that organization, outlining your concerns, speaking uh, if there is a, a plan in place, understanding what that plan may look like, um, and then mo moving forward and, and monitoring that plan. This board has done that in the past with organizations. So I do think that's an option. Okay, so, and and you, and I think just from the standpoint of a board member who's, who's new to this process, um, I think one of the challenges that I foresee is, and, and I think your suggestion here would be, okay, so you have an organization that has, you know, um, potentially, hypothetically, non-Vermont organization, we're not a Vermont board, so we can sort of hypothetical this scenario to, to get you out of the, the, the bind that you're in a little bit. But a, a, an organization that has uh, a series of underperforming expense management growths, and your suggestion would be to approve the budget, but put in a corrective action plan of some kind or a reporting plan to try to improve that expense management growth. But in the meantime, that then leads to a higher commercial rate which leads to higher commercial insurance, which leads to affordability slash underinsurance, having to choose a bronze plan instead of a silver plan, higher deductibles, you know, as you say, you know, and I will, I, I can refer you patients when I see them in the emergency department to say, please call Mr. Del Treco. He would like to help you with managing your, your challenges with deferring care because of your high copays or delaying till next year because you don't want to get, you know, you're trying to put it all into one year or whatnot, but it's real. So if we approve that budget, we increase that commercial rate, that translates to commercial rate insurance increases, that translates to challenges for people for affordability. But, but, but what you're suggesting is that the corrective action plan within that would be sufficient, you feel, to, to, to work to that, say, expense growth issue. That's a big hypothetical question, um, and I and I think that the there are opportunities to have the conversation with those organizations, evaluate, and you need to make the decisions you need to make. Um, I do think uh, that these organizations, um, uh, uh, um, when you assess 
uh, operational efficiency, uh, cost growth. I think it is important to understand what those uh, what those numbers are comprised of. Uh, when you look at some of our uh, indicators on per per uh, per beneficiary uh, growth in Medicaid, uh, excuse me, in Medicare, we we're we're very very good. Our Commonwealth report, which me measures several dimensions of healthcare, we're in the top five historically. Um, so I think we also have to step back and say. Um, uh, and embrace and say, uh, look at all the actually powerful things that we've done in Vermont, um, and, and rather than uh, this moment of we have this massive affordability problem uh, and, and look at that as the single deciding factor. Um, if we hadn't done some of the things we've done historically since the inception of the Green Mountain Care Board, things probably would look a lot different. Um, our hospitals embrace uh, healthcare reform um, from from southern Vermont to northern Vermont. Our small communities, our critical access hospitals that um, enter into these all payer model uh, agreements, uh, it wouldn't happen in any other state. They would say, "No, I'm not taking that risk. This is this is outrageous." But we don't. We actually step up. We we are actually doing this work. So, um, where are we? Uh, versus where we could have been needs to be evaluated in that conversation. I appreciate that response. I think you 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 highlighted something that I think is something that we're going to be having to to try to understand, which is which is data and metrics. You know, you cite certain data for high performing, and there's also data that sort of discusses you know high cost. And I think that that. That like uh, almost what you're saying is that no data is perfect data, and so we're going to have to deal with the data we have. So I, I appreciate that that response. Thank you. Yeah, and on Dr. Merman's point, it seems like there's pretty big disparity even within Vermont hospitals of operating expense growth. Um, presuming this data is accurate, you see you know Copley at five percent expense growth over two years. I think UVM Medical Center 15, Porter 17, and then Northwestern just down at 3.54. So there is a large disparity um, in the expense growth, and that is something that I think we have to grapple with um, as we do this. Um, and I have, um, I'll email you right now actually. Um, I met with a patient Monday night who was having financial challenges. Uh, he advised that he had a missed cancer diagnosis and was on a payment plan, but then went to collections. Um, so I'll email you that that person's um, name and contact information. I'll ask them if it's okay with them. But I appreciate sure, that sir. offer. I think it's I think it's great. Chair Foster, um, but before we move on, you you mentioned again expense growth and the administrative component to that and variation in administrative expenses. Um, and earlier in the conversation, it was brought up that regulation is something that needs to be paid for. And that that would be that's a potential cause of some of the growth um, in administrative expenses. But I just want to point out that federal regulations apply to all hospitals. So when we compare one hospital to another, we can't claim that one place is suffering under federal regulation more than another. It's all the same. And all 50 states regulate health care. It's often said that Vermont's unique, but every state can rightly say that it is unique because they all designed their own regulation. So they all have regulation expenses. And when we compare Vermont hospitals to other hospitals ac across the country, those are already factored in. It, I don't think it's correct to say that the regulation um, expenses in Vermont <clears throat> are outrageous compared to other places. Every place deals with those. I just wanted to point that out because of earlier conversation. Just, just to just to correct one thing, I, I don't know that they're outrageous. They exist. Um, so, and 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 they may be different from state to state, um, but I do know what um, the there are 629 over 629 federal uh, regulatory processes that happen throughout the country. Um, but there are unique things with that happen within the state. Um, so those are the issues that I pointed out. 
Mr. Thank Chair, you. I think one, one, sorry, Member Walsh, were you still? Yeah, I, I, I agree. There are a lot of federal regulations. They apply to every hospital and each state has regulations that hospitals within that state have to deal with. Um, go ahead, Mr. Fisher, and then I'm getting uh, some messages. Yeah, that we should, I think it's um, time to, to, move, to, on. to move on, but I, I did want to make a simple point, and that is that um, it's easy to see the individuals who come to us, come to my office or to um, Member Merman's emergency department as individuals who need to be addressed, and they do. <laughs> I run a whole shop that addresses people's individual needs. This is a structural problem. This is not the failings of a few of some individuals. This is a predictable outcome due to the system we have. I just want to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, well, thank you both very much. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Dostaka. I just want to say thanks for the conversation. I think this is important. Um, I think this dialogue uh, demonstrates um, everyone here's commitment to what's happening. Um, so I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I know we have a lot of work ahead of us. So thank you. Same. Thank you, Dr. Treco. I agree. Great. Um, thank you for your time and, and for making opening statements today and for the dialogue. I think it's really helpful to the process. And I will, I will excuse you both and we will turn to uh, Director Lindbergh. Good morning. <clears throat> Our slides showing up for other folks. Great. Um, so thank you very much to Mr. Detreco, Mr. Del Treco and Mr. Fisher. Uh, they had been invited for brief opening remarks, and uh, that was a very robust conversation. But from a process standpoint, we'll make sure to build that in for time <laughs> in the future if we end up having a Q&A for our closing uh, remarks. So uh, Sarah Lindbergh, Director of Health Systems Finance for the Green Mountain Care Board. And I am here to just present an overview of the hospital budgets that have been submitted for fiscal year 24. Uh, we will be walking through the budget process and uh, Russ McCracken will be walking through that with you all. And then we will cover some national context, some overview of the 24 submissions and give you a preview of the budget review tool that will be guiding us through the submissions this year. Uh, so with that, I will turn it to Mr. McCracken. Um, great. Thank you, Sarah. I, I just wanted to provide a little um, reminder of the budget process and um, some of the elements of the guidance and the statute that the board has, um, um, you know, adopted in the uh, spring and kind of what the statute sets out for this budget review process. So um, on an annual basis, the board has the responsibility to review and establish budgets for Vermont's 14 community hospitals. In its review, the board is going to consider factors including labor expenses, utilization, pharmaceutical expenses, cost inflation, commercial price increases, financial indicators, known pricing changes for Medicare and Medicaid, uncompensated care, and other factors. Um, sorry to read the list. This is all, these are the factors set out in the guidance that the board adopted back in March. Um, as part of this, you know, the board is also going to consider hear and consider testimony from the hospitals and receive and consider comments from members of the public uh, and the healthcare advocate. Uh, so the, the second bullet here is a, a statement that came out of our guidance, um, but it's a reminder that the board uh, executes its uh, budget review and consistent, uh, consistent with its statutory obligations. So the review process is um, as required by statute, consistent with the principles for health care reform um, that the board is obligated to follow that are set out in 18 BSA 9371. Uh, Section 9371 sets out 14 different principles as a framework for health care reform. Those include the principle that all Vermonters must receive affordable and appropriate health care at the appropriate time in the appropriate setting, and the principle that overall health care costs must be contained in growth and growth in health care spending in Vermont must balance the health care needs of the population with the ability to pay for such care. Uh, it's important to note here that the board's review process also must adhere to the hospital budget requirements uh, set out in the hospital budget statute of 18 BSA 9456. 
um, which as a reminder says that individual hospital budgets established under the section uh, by the board must be consistent with uh, the health resource allocation plan and must take into account uh, take into consideration national, regional, or in-state peer group norms according to indicators, ratios, and statistics established by the board, um, which again is uh, covered in the board's uh, guidance that was adopted earlier this year. Uh, budgets must promote efficient and economic operation of the hospital, reflect budget performance for prior years, um, address the uh, hospital submission for a uh, uh, um, an analysis uh, reflecting a reduction in net revenues for non-Medicaid payers and uh, demonstrate that they support equal access to appropriate mental health care needs that meet the standards of quality access and affordability uh, equivalent to other uh, components of the health care system. Um, there are some procedural aspects to this as well, including that the hospital, uh, including that the board will meet with hospitals, which we're starting today. Um, and then as a, you know, as a further note, uh, as the board knows, decisions must be made by September 15th, uh, and then written orders must be issued by October 1st. Those are dates set out in the statute as well. Um, for any further uh, questions from, uh, and as a reference for the public, we have a link here at the bottom um, that gives uh, access to all of the um, background guidance and hospital budget um, materials that have been submitted. Uh, so next slide, and I think I'm turning it back to you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just for the back of your mind, uh, for the first time, uh, according to a statutory change, we will be engaging in a full budget review of the Brattleboro Retreat. <clears throat> However, their fiscal year is different than the community hospitals, so we'll be taking that up later this year. <clears throat> uh, for the 14 hospitals before us now, uh, we have a public comment period that's uh, been in place for a bit. If you would like a comment to be considered officially and synthesized by staff, we would like to see those comments by noon on Friday, August 25th. However, as hopefully is well understood, we welcome comment at any point. Budget materials for each hospital may be found online, and you can see the most recent uh, budget schedule online as well. We've had to make a few tweaks along the way. Um, new board members didn't know they didn't get a summer apparently, so. <laughs> All right, as far as uh, national context, um, so we know, we know that inflation has been uh, increasing significantly uh, in the past few years, historically high inflation. There is evidence that that is cooling to more um, historically typical levels, um, but as you can see, inflation as measured for medical services and all goods and services tend to be a bit lagged. Um, so often the prices for healthcare are very sticky, meaning that they can only be updated once a year. And so sometimes if you shift this curve, you can kind of see a more direct correlation, but for now, it looks like both are uh, decreasing significantly uh, in the most recent information available. Uh, we also see that um, that we are starting to see some recovery nationally. So this is from a Kaufman Hall flash report with uh, operating results through June. Uh, we can see that the year-to-date margins are starting to sugar out to be positive. However, we're also seeing growing disparities uh, between hospitals uh, who are recovering successfully and those who are still unable to get back to uh, where they had been. I think there's some questions about what the new normal is going to look like and uh, how, how we're going to interpret <laughs> what recovery looks like in this new environment. <clears throat> So if you look at the national landscape, there are some very hard decisions that hospitals are having to make. Uh, I just pulled a few headlines uh, in recent press. So Becker's currently sees 76 hospitals and health systems who are uh, track, uh, cutting jobs. Uh, the last headline is from the Valley News talking about Dartmouth Health's initiative to cut $120 million out of its budget. They're planning hiring freezes and uh, making sure to review jobs. These are uh, measures that I think Vermont hospitals are undertaking as well in a lot of cases. Uh, and then we see that the layoffs um, 
are hitting the healthcare sector, which is unusual. It tends to be a sector that is um, somewhat protected uh, in these situations, but we see that uh, there's an 81% increase in layoffs, uh, according to the health exec uh, study that is being uh, cited there. So um, those are those are jobs that are being lost, and I think that you know that's the as a regulator um, a hard thing to understand that might be necessary right now. Um, <clears throat> when we look at employment trends, uh, I think we've covered this before, but if you look at kind of the recovery in jobs. Since the pandemic, uh, jobs are not recovering anywhere near where they had been expected to be. So that uh, labor market is extremely tight um, and that is being felt here in Vermont. But we also see on the right that uh, the consolidation effect. So more and more uh, physicians are being employed by hospitals or other corporate entities over time. And we see um, that escalating um, as people, again, try to grapple with some of these um, difficult financial challenges. Uh, probably not news to anyone that uh, pharmaceutical expenses are a, a main, uh, a significant expense pressure being faced not only by hospitals, but by consumers as well. You can see that especially new S drugs going. Sarah, this is Dave. Um, I don't know if you're advancing your slides. Oh, I'm I have it still to. on slide eight. I don't know if other people are still seeing that or if. I'm on slide 10. Okay. All right, that's my issue then. It's possible you navigated away from me. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can go through manually. So okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, so we see that um, it's these new entrants that have a quite high price tag. So these often are specialty drugs. Um, there's some being marketed right now uh, related to Alzheimer's that are significantly expensive. There's also um, some new uh, emerging trends in uh, drugs that are designed to help with obesity um, that are quite expensive. Um, and you can see that uh, these trends are just difficult uh, to control. Uh, the supply chain is very complex <laughs> and uh, obfuscated. So this is one that I think federally we're uh, trying to grapple with. Um, another national trend is we see more and more care uh, moving to an outpatient setting. So uh, inpatient meaning that's when you get checked into the hospital and stay overnight, whereas an outpatient uh, procedure often you might think of as day surgery. So this is showing the trends as it relates to hip and knee replacement uh, changing settings. Uh, historically, inpatient revenue is a lot easier to predict and uh, budget for, uh, whereas outpatient tends to be a lot more mercurial um, and a little bit more sensitive to some of the variable costs that uh, providers face. So uh, also tend to see higher relative reimbursement uh, in the outpatient setting as compared to inpatient. And uh, I think we've seen this slide before, but as we can see that, um, you know, inflation uh, since 2000 has been uh, twice that of uh, the overall inflation for hospitals and health services, or I'm sorry, that's specifically hospital services that grew at 227% compared to general inflation that grew at 104%, or I'm sorry, 74%, um, whereas the hourly wages increased by just over 100% from 2000 to, this is through June of 2022. So these, uh, Inflationary expenses, as felt by consumers, uh, have been compounding over time. And uh, rural hospitals are particularly vulnerable. Uh, their revenue uh, is based on the cost of what they provide largely to Medicare beneficiaries, and that their margins are often very tight. Uh, if you know, if you know, generally trying to just break even, so they've been very vulnerable in the volatility um, associated with the pandemic and all the associated aftermath. So uh, we do see some hospitals at risk of closure here, according to um, our colleagues over at um, uh, <laughs> their name is escaping me. Um, Sugar, uh, the Check rural center. health project. Is Shop center. center, thank you. Oh my gosh, okay. thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so they do really great work over there. I can't believe I forgot their name. Um, so yeah, so that's just you know a, a reality that uh, that you know if hospitals close, that has an effect on communities and just uh, trying to understand 
that effect. Um, all right, so the submissions that we got. So I would say in my reading and uh, in co consultation with the team that we see that, you know, the hospitals that were Vermont hospitals face do mirror most of those that we're seeing nationally. So we see that continued reliance on um, non-operating revenue, which can be uh, especially vulnerable. Um, some of that non-operating revenue was uh, provider relief and CARES Act uh, payment enhancements that have expired. We also um, know that the revenue associated with the 340B program uh, is continues to decline federally. And I would say that one thing that's probably different about Vermont is we tend to have a greater reliance on that 340B revenue just because such a high proportion of our hospitals are critical access hospitals. Uh, the higher than average inflation is something that everyone's feeling, uh, especially when it comes to labor, though we, as we covered, that is uh, appearing to slow the cost of pharmaceuticals, difficult to control. And uh, one thing that might make that better for a hospital is their leverage in a negotiation. And since Vermont hospitals tend to be smaller, there might be an additional challenge in, uh, for, um, in the negotiation uh, leverage there. Uh, the ability to attract and retain staff is a common theme across the submissions. Um, I would say that in the, BL, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data is a bit lagged, um, but just in anecdotally talking with uh, uh, CFOs, uh, chief financial officers, that they feeling a real shift uh, in Vermont being a more local or regional market to really being national in their competition for uh, staff. Um, the ability to discharge people to post-acute facilities is also something that we're seeing nationally. I would say just because our supply starts off lower in Vermont, that there is probably a more uh, dramatic impact locally. Um, and then again, we just have a very high proportion of rural providers. So anything that's affecting that uh, segment is going to be felt more acutely here in the most rural state or one of the most rural states. <clears throat> So we are working on improving the hospital budget process. It is a process <laughs> to improve. So this is a step in that direction, but it will take uh, a few years to continue to enhance that. Uh, we are folding in some new publicly available data sources so that we can be better understand how Vermont hospitals expenses are growing uh, compared to what has been seen historically and uh, nationally. I would say that what we are have targeted to enhance in fiscal year 25 and beyond are more kind of direct applications of quality, productivity, patient access, equity, consumer affordability, and per capita budgeting. So those are all ones that we may talk about this year, but haven't been as formally uh, addressed uh, in the expense factors as we hope to uh, evolve to. Uh, I think we've talked about this ad nauseum, but uh, the fiscal year 24 budget guidance inherits a benchmark from the fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, that 23 guidance established a two-year benchmark, and so this year uh, that means that NPR growth from the fiscal year 22 actuals to 24 budgets of no more than 8.6%. We talked quite a bit in the reconsideration about uh, how that is an ambitious target. And um, as a reminder from where it came from, when the all pair model was negotiated, uh, the theory was to keep uh, health care, total cost of care growth more in line with gross state product. So depending on the length of time and your look back when that was negotiated, that uh, historical growth was between 3.5 and 4.3%. Uh, that has not been uh, the trend <laughs> that we've experienced in recent years, uh, but it felt important to have some uh, something to compare it to that comes from uh, a state uh, objective or a state priority. And so that that is where that 8.6 comes from is two years of that maximum growth. So uh, we do see here, and uh, it's a uh, that by and large we see some improvement in our hospitals. So if you look in the operating margins, uh, most but not all uh, have shown some improvement um, between where fiscal year 22 landed and where they are through June of this year. Um, again, we saw that trend 
in the national context. So that's uh, not necessarily a surprise. Um, and we see that some, in some cases that we are seeing also the rebound of the total margin. So the operating margin is just looking at the operating expense compared to operating revenue, whereas the total margin is the whole enchilada. Um, we're still seeing a pretty uh, lower levels of days cash on hand, which is what DCOH stands for. Uh, so we see uh, kind of a mixed bag there. Uh, cash is something that uh, can be helpful, especially if borrowing is expecting to be more expensive in future years. Um, and as uh, existing debt service coverage ratios have uh, been depleted, uh, we have more than one hospital that has violated some debt covenants. And so some of the metrics that they're held to have been adjusted to make sure that they have more liquidity. So they have more cash, um, helps reduce any risk that the borrower might feel. Uh, so when we look at the submissions, we've got uh, three columns here. We've got uh, what the submission looks like for fiscal year 24 as compared to the 22 actuals. We have how the 22 actuals are looking for 23 projections to date and how those actuals compare to what was approved. So this is just telling us um, for revenue, uh, our hospitals kind of on budget or not. Uh, it is sort of, so as a system, um, the 22 actuals to the 24 submission uh, grows by 19.1% with actuals to projected uh, year to date expecting to grow 11, uh, which as a system, uh, we are uh, what you would say under budget, but uh, the system doesn't have a budget in and of itself. Um, and you can see for some hospitals uh, that they are more than 2% over or under the budget as submitted. So we see most uh, are over and one that is under uh, from those uh, projections for the year to date, or I'm sorry, projections for fiscal year 23. Uh, just a reminder, net patient revenue is revenue from all payers. So this is gonna include Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, self-pay, workers' comp, all that good stuff. And so I think that, um, as we evolve and think about expenses instead of revenue, uh, these numbers in and of themselves uh, require a little bit more investigation, right? So if we look at uh, operating expense growth, <laughs> you'll see a much different story where many, many hospitals are over budget. Um, so they, in good faith, uh, set targets for their operating expenses, um, but those can have continued to be a challenge in the current fiscal year. So we see that while the system as a whole intended to grow by 2%, uh, the projection is more like 5.6% operating expense growth. Um, now, operating expense growth, just like operating revenue, has many components. So just looking at these in and of itself doesn't tell the whole story. And that's part of what the budget process is designed to do, is to learn more about these pressures and how hospitals are dealing with them uh, and uh, try to get a sense of um, the amount of expense that is uh, controllable. And I think that's a, a healthy conversation to be having. Um, but you can see that uh, any number is going to be, the smaller the number you're dealing with, the more dramatic a proportion can seem. So if your income goes from $1 to $2, that's 100% growth. If it goes from $100 to $101, it's a 1% growth rate. So that denominator matters. Um, so I would say that you know when you look at some of these numbers, one question I always ask myself is how big is that, that number to start? <clears throat> um, and so then rates is probably uh, one of the things that is of most interest uh, in the proceedings this year. So uh, we're trying to get a better sense of how gross revenue or charge master changes uh, have relate to what happens to commercial net revenue. So the charges are that if you look at your explanation of benefits, you'll often see a charge number that is a, a very high number, and you'll see a second number that is the negotiated amount between your insurer and uh, the hospital for those of us with insurance, which I know is not everyone by any means. Um, so that charge master has gotten 
further and further away from the actual allowed amount. So we needed, I think it would be benefit our regulation to have a better grasp of that net amount versus the charge. So we see that um, <clears throat> that the average two-year growth in that net commercial revenue varies between 5.6% and 14 point, oh no, 2.8% and 14.1%. So that's just taking the growth uh, in the actual to the, from the fiscal year 23 actual to the fiscal year 24 submission, uh, what it looks like the estimated commercial effective rate looks like from fiscal year 23 to 24 and averaging them with a simple um, compounding annual growth rate. So you'll see uh, some discrepancy between the charge and the net revenue columns. Uh, in most cases, we would expect to see the charge master grow more than the net revenue uh, proportion. So remember, it's usually a discount over uh, off the charge, but that hasn't been the case for some hospitals. So that's another topic of conversation uh, that we'll have during hearings. And want to note that the numbers here for Gifford uh, are for just the, the expected growth from 23 to 24 due to the work they've been doing on their charge master and in implementing their EMR, they have not had an opportunity to implement priorly, prior approved rate increases. So when you look at the actual numbers, they're gonna look a little bit different than this because of those um, adjustments accounting for previous years. Uh, also of note is while we did in our findings of fact last year, get an estimate for commercial effective rate from all hospitals, that's not been something that's been historically ordered for any hospitals but the UVM Health Network hospitals. And uh, just as we learn and grow, uh, one thing that I think we need to try to wrap our minds around is a rate that an insurer is thinking of is not the same rate you're seeing here. And so we'll talk a lot about that in the process this year and how we can kind of try to be measuring the same thing across those processes or similar things anyway. Uh, so as far as operating margins and total margins, uh, so we can see, again, there were um, only a handful of hospitals that were able to complete fiscal year 22 in the black, meaning they had a positive operating margin. Uh, we do see that improving in the projections for fiscal year 23. Um, and, you know, all but one budget is expecting to have a pretty uh, modest margin. Now, this is a place where uh, Gifford stands out again. And as we'll talk about in their hearing, um, they are in a pretty unique situation in that they are owned by an FQHC, which there's maybe a uh, I could probably count on one hand how common that is in the United States. <laughs> uh, so their consolidated margin uh, looks much different than this one. Um, but other than that, we uh, the only other margin we see coming in above 3% uh, is for Porter. Um, and total margin again, uh, there we only saw three hospitals finish uh, profitably in uh, the marginal sense in fiscal year 22. Uh, projections look much rosier uh, with only looks like one, two, three, four, five hospitals finish uh, projected to finish in the red this year. Um, and budgets, um, you know, seem to show expectations that that uh, continues to improve from what they submitted. All right, uh, so we did outline a lot of data in the guidance this year. And so to try to distill all that information in one actionable place. Uh, we are using a budget review tool. Uh, we will be going through that in a moment. Might be helpful to get, get some questions before we move change screens here, but uh, I just wanna be clear that these are new metrics. They're designed to be conversations. Every data source is gonna have its strengths and weaknesses. And so, um, you know, I, I, I mean, this is just me, but I think leading with curiosity and trying to understand um, is is really the name of the game this year um, as we all look to improve um, our processes and understanding uh, of the budgets as submitted. So uh, if it suits the chair, I can take some questions now before we move on to the tool or we could just hold them till after that. Um, I, why don't we do some now if any board members have questions? Uh, I don't have any myself, but if anyone else does, please go ahead.
Sarah, I just have a quick one. Um, I think it was on slide 18, the day's cash on hand for Springfield had an NA. Is that coming soon? Yep, we're working on yeah. getting the rest of that information. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. And Sarah, I just have a, a quick question. Um, on slide six, you talked about medical care inflation. And on slide 13, you talked about consumer inflation for medical services. And I, I think part of what the difference is, is you have a, a compounded versus a annualized rate. But could, are those the same they, they things both just looked at differently? Or, or yeah. Yeah, sorry. yeah. They're both CPIU or, or consumer price index uh, measures. I didn't go to see if they're including all the same things in medical across those two. I, so that other chart would break out the medical care services, whereas this has combined medical services, uh, commodities, equipment, and drugs. Okay. So on the other graph, which doesn't go to 23, but this one does, we might expect that line to plateau for for yeah. a year. Okay, just thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Wonderful, so give me a moment to, I'm gonna turn off my camera and share my browser. So we can look at the budget review tool. Um, so uh, I want to first and foremost uh, thank everyone for their patience. Uh, the flood did uh, postpone the launch of this more than I would have liked. <laughs> so here we are, though, uh, with our tool. And what Sarah, I'm going to just sorry, may I just interrupt? Is there a possibility that you could blow it up a little bit? Is it possible is, to have? This this is as big as it's going to be. Okay, hit. sorry, just um, that I would check. No. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. No worries. Uh, yeah, Tableau's not as responsive as one might uh, hope uh, at any rate. <laughs> so our intent here is not to look at any specific hospital, but get a sense of the measures that are included here and why, and give you kind of a, a forecast of the information that we uh, will be discussing. Uh, so uh, this overview tab uh, shows uh, so the green check corresponds to the filings that were on time and complete. Uh, so most hospitals uh, were. Uh, there were a few that we had uh, some delays in getting the complete uh, filing in. And on the left-hand side, uh, you can see uh, how the uh, change in NPR is between the fiscal year 22 actuals and the sub budgets as submitted. And the right graph is summarizing it for the change in operating expenses. We don't have an explicit benchmark for operating expenses. However, as we look to flip kind of our focus from a revenue to expense uh, basis, I think it's good to start thinking about uh, that sort of thing. Um, so you can select a specific hospital uh, with this drop down menu. You can uh, filter for just a specific type of hospital, um, and you can also filter based on network. So if you just wanted to see DART, the Dartmouth affiliated hospitals or the UVM Health Network affiliated hospitals. Um, and so in the table, uh, these are the values that are graphed in the left-hand uh, visualization. Uh, these values in the operating expense column are graphed on the right-hand viz. Um, and then we have a summary of the charge master increases in aggregate from fiscal year 23 to 24, as well as the estimated commercial uh, effective rate from 23 to 24. So that's a snap comparative snapshot of the submissions uh, for folks to take a look at. Um, and in the budget tab, we have uh, uh, for each hospital, we have uh, the NPR target, whether or not that is within the 8.6 over 10 years, uh, notes from the narrative, and then some staff notes where applicable. Um, so each expense factor is summarized uh, for net patient revenue, operating expenses. Remember, we don't have a, 
uh, benchmark uh, for labor. Uh, what we're looking at is the per FTE growth over time. Uh, utilization has to do with the um, change in adjusted discharges over time. Pharmaceutical expenses uh, are what we've got in terms of historical information uh, on the expenses as reported in adaptive. Uh, cost inflation uh, is meant to be non-pharmaceutical uh, expense growth, and then the commercial price is our estimate of that effective commercial rate. Again, not an explicit benchmark on that factor. Um, so for financial information, uh, we are showing the change over time uh, between NPR, which is the orange line, and operating expenses, which is the blue line. Uh, and then we also have some key financial metrics. Uh, we've got the total margin, uh, which has been pretty bumpy uh, in recent years, as well as the operating margin. Uh, we also have the operating EBITDA margin. Uh, EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, uh, uh, <laughs> depreciation, and amortization. Um, so that's kind of a clean apples to apples uh, look at profitability. Um, and then the day's cash on hand. Um, so, uh, you know, for Southwest, we know that um, their structural relationship means that uh, much of the cash is held at their parent organization. So seeing them in this red zone is uh, a little bit different than any other hospital. And we'll talk more about that when they come in. Um, so the labor tab is um, showing, uh, uh, oops, that's not a good example. It was showing uh, so what the per FTE uh, compensation was in 2017. And this benchmark is showing us if we just advanced that value by the employment cost index, uh, which is what Medicare uses for its uh, you know, expense growth on that side, uh, where that would be in fiscal year 22 and where the hospital is landing. Um, and we can see also how the full-time equivalents have changed over time. So notably, this is just salaried employees as reported to us in adaptive. There are cost accounting differences that we might be talking about in hearings. And we also, so as an example, uh, Gifford's done some dramatic reorganization in recent years. So we'll have, this probably is not a very meaningful chart for them over time. Uh, and you know, for others, it probably is. And so uh, that's the, the the intent of that uh, tab. Um, utilization. Here we're looking at how things uh, change together. Um, so how are changes in utilization changing compared to net payer revenue? So we don't include any graduate medical education or dish. This is the amount of money uh, paid by payers to the hospital, be it through claims or fixed uh, perspective payments. Uh, we also see how that uh, changes with operating expenses. So, um, you know, depending on your size, uh, that might, some of these lines are gonna look bumpier than others. And on the bottom, uh, we have the uh, emergency department utilization over time sourced from our hospital discharge data set. So that data is provided um, by hospitals and has been provided since I think the 1980s. And so it's a nice uh, kind of consistent uh, data set. And what we see here is um, the outpatient uh, ED utilization proportion and those who are admitted. So if we're gonna talk about uh, potentially avoidable use, we would expect that to come out of this um, gray bucket. And when it comes to migration, uh, this is uh, again, gonna be a conversation as no data source is perfect. Uh, but what we have here is uh, for inpatient on the left and outpatient, uh, what those discharges have looked like. So we only have anything that would touch a facility claim or a UBO4 as we call it. Um, and then what proportion of those discharges or that utilization is coming 
from the hospital's HSA and what is coming from outside the HSA. So that's the in-migration. And so, um, you know, you can see that these patterns are going to look a lot different for um, a border hospital um, versus um, someone that um, is uh, less close to the border. Um, and then you might see people traveling for tertiary care as well. Um, so say a UBM. Uh, and then on the bottom, so now we're not talking about utilization, we're talking about dollars. These are claims-based dollars as they appear in our all-payer claims database, which is not all the dollars by any means. So first, these are only people that have uh, Medicaid coverage through the state of Vermont or Medicare coverage through uh, the federal uh, traditional uh, fee-for-service as well as um, uh, this also will include Medicare Advantage business, uh, so add that we get in VCARES. And then the commercial market is the one where we have the most questions. Uh, we know that uh, by, we're missing at a little over half of self-funded business at this point, um, which can be quite significant. We also won't have anyone with military coverage called TRICARE. We won't have federal employees in there and also anyone uh, without insurance or anything paid through workers comp or other third party liability insurance. So, um, but of the information we have and how it looks over time, uh, we can see for a specific service area. So for folks with a mailing address in one of the White River Junction service area, we can see that most of those dollars are not staying in that service area. So. Uh, most of those dollars are leaving, and you can further kind of look at it. So, well, is it any different for just professional services on those uh, CMS 1500 claims um, versus uh, inpatient or outpatient facility? Um, but we'll see that that can look very different depending on the HSA. Um, so this is getting a sense of folks who are traveling for care. Um, the cost report is probably one that will have the most uh, to learn, uh, so how these things uh, are different, but uh, these are a summary of uh, many of the gold standard metrics that Mr. Reese presented a few uh, meetings ago. Um, so we have a peer group flag, so you can look at, um, you know, mid-sized rural academic uh, members of the Association of American Medical Colleges, mid-sized rural hospitals or critical access hospitals, um, and uh, you are able to kind of highlight the Vermont hospitals when you click on the orange part, um, and you can see um, how they're performing on these metrics. As a quick reminder, so adjusted discharges is our measure of size. That takes the inpatient discharges and scales them by the ratio of inpatient and outpatient revenue. Um, I'm sorry, charges. Uh, we also have the Medicare case mix. So as a reminder, when you have inpatient care and Medicare is paying you, it's often uh, what's called a DRG payment or a diagnosis related group payment. And each of those payments has a certain weight associated with the resources involved. So open heart surgery will have a much higher weight than an outpatient visit, say, or you wouldn't have that in inpatient, pardon me, but for, say, uh, uh, colonoscopy. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have much different weights. And so that's giving you a sense of, so here at St. Joseph, uh, they have a much higher patient acuity than they do here at um, whoever's on the end here, Newport Hospital. So that's just a range of the um, inpatient acuity of patients. Um, the ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries, um, so that is taking uh, just the admin and general line uh, from the cost report, which I, I'm with Mike, I think that's line five, um, and, and then comparing that to um, the salaries paid for inpatient routine services, outpatient services, ancillary services, uh, essentially lines 30 through 100, whatever. Um, so what that ratio looks like, this is one that we have a lot to learn. This is going to be really sensitive uh, to the corporate structure of the hospital. It's not designed uh, to reflect the uh, expenses associated with owned physicians. That's something that we would want to look at the Form 990 to get a better handle on. But um, I think Really, what we're looking for here is uh, uh, how we can think about um, creating a reasonable 
comparable index for this. So this is kind of our, our first stab, but I think what we'll be able to further improve this metric over time. Uh, cash for operations, uh, just a note here that, um, you know, despite the cash listed here, some of that might be restricted. Um, so sometimes you'll get a donation that can only be used for certain things. Um, and uh, so that is, again, an, a conversation that we'll be having. Um, the IBIDAR, so we talked about EBITDA earlier. This is adding also uh, as, uh, expenses associated with rent um, and seeing this is going to be our closest thing to a profitability metric um, from cost reports. Um, and then the CMI adjusted cost per adjusted discharge. So this is taking... Uh, from MedPAR, which is uh, Medicare fee-for-service claims, uh, taking the average cost, so they use the cost-to-charge ratio for that uh, cost center and allocate the expense that way, and uh, we scale that by the case mix index. So it tries to get as apples to apples as possible um, for that cost per discharge. Again, we'll have a lot to talk about um, Notably, this is only going to be Medicare fee-for-service claims, and Vermont is relatively late to the game when it comes to Medicare Advantage. So some things we see here might be more related to that than anything else. Hey, Sarah. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. Before you move on, um, could you explain the dark square, the light square, and the lines on oh, each of these, please? Sure. That's always good. I forget that not everyone loves box plots like I do. So this is a box plot. Um, it is a way that nerds like me like to look at the distribution of data. So these dots are the distribution of the data points, and this box is helping us summarize it. So uh, the line between where the light and dark box is, is what we call a median, uh, which says half of the points are above this line and half of the points are below this line. So it's a measure of position, um, which means that um, we're not going to get dragged around too much by outliers. Um, so with an average, you know, if there are five people in a coffee shop and one of them is Bill Gates, um, your average compensation would be way bigger than your median, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then when we go down to the um, end of the dark gray box, that's our 25th percentile. So that's where 25% of the observations are lower than that and 75% are higher than that. And then we go down to the lower whisker, um, which in this case um, is the... Uh, three times what we call the interquartile range, which is the value of the middle 50% of the data. So here's our 25th percentile, our 50th percentile in the middle, and the upper end of the box is our 75th percentile. So that's where the middle 50% of our data is. This is what 1.5 times that range looks like. Anyone above that uh, might be considered an outlier or in some cases an extreme outlier. All right, was that too fast or picking up what I put down? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> thank you. All right, yeah, no worries, thank you. I totally meant to cover that. Um, all right, and then so cost coverage, this is one that probably will take the most thinking to digest or it does for me anyway. So let's just start with um, inpatient care. Um, so on the top here, uh, and this is, hot off the presses, fiscal year 22 data. So um, we have commercial, Medicare, and Vermont Medicaid. These are the primary payer, so who paid first. And we're seeing what the um, average payment was per discharge or on the outpatient side, ambulatory payment classification service. Um, so that is the average payment that was received. So you can see that commercial bars are higher than the governmental payer bars. So that is uh, that uh, difference in payment. And the bar is what Medicare says the average cost was. So much like the last tab, we um, apply the cost to charge ratio for the applicable cost center and uh, figure out what Medicare thinks that cost. Medicare does not reimburse for all costs, so this is the Medicare allowable cost. 
And then above here, you can see what the payment is compared uh, to that Medicare allowable cost. So we see for inpatient at Dartmouth, 68% of the Medicare allowable cost is covered for Met Vermont Medicaid and 60% is covered for UVMMC. We see that UVMMC is uh, providing a lower cost service as Medicare would say, and that is true across payer types. Um, and then what, these numbers notably are not adjusted for acuity um, because this is what it's going to look like from a budgetary standpoint. Unfortunately, you don't get to risk adjust your payments. Uh, ex well, sometimes you do, but uh, that's not the norm today. Um, and then here, what we see is what the cost coverage has looked like over time. And so uh, here we see declining inpatient cost coverage from Medicare and Medicaid over time and uh, what that's done to the commercial uh, inpatient rates. We can um, also see what that looks like um, just for the uh, outpatient setting. Um, and fiscal year 22 is a rough one, uh, or was a rough one. <clears throat> Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have tried to package um, some information from RAND in, in their hospital transparency study. Um, and so what this is doing is taking standardized prices. Uh, I, RAND provides two numbers in their analysis. They provide the relative reimbursement um, compared to what Medicare would pay, and they provide this standardized price. So one uh, kind of important note about Medicare is that they actually don't pay everyone the same. <laughs> they pay differently based on several adjustments and those are designed uh, to reflect kind of the wage in the area and, and other factors such as your designation. So um, that denominator can change and kind of distort that relative comparison in some ways. And uh, we have some notable changes in Medicare reimbursement due to the wage changes and uh, some designation changes that mean I think the standardized price is probably uh, a more valuable comparator. Um, and so this is pooling data from 2018 to 2020. So it's very old. <laughs> They're working on their next round. Um, but uh, I just think that it's important to note how dated uh, this information is. Um, however, uh, you are able to you know, uh, highlight either a Vermont hospital or a regional hospital, um, a regional academic medical center. So you'll see, for instance, Albany Medical Center. So for each inpatient discharge, uh, the commercial reimbursement was about $36,000, uh, whereas their payment for uh, per outpatient service was down at 192. So we see that they were below that 25th percentile when it comes to the outpatient reimbursement, but above quite far above the 75th percentile for the inpatient care. So that's uh, that's what I got. I can leave this open if there are any questions or more details that would be helpful. Um, we'll have uh, our first uh, guest starting in 20 minutes. So wanna be mindful if folks want a little bathroom break before that starts too. Um, Sarah, I just tried to put you on the spot here, but the declining cost coverage, could you go to that again real quick? Mm-hmm. And to what do you attribute the declining cost coverage for our hospitals from Medicare and Medicaid, if if anything, if you have any insights? Yeah, so costs are accelerating faster than payments is kind of a short answer. Um, and I think that even the Medicare allowable costs uh, have not reflected the recent inflationary increases uh, as much uh, as one might hope if you're a hospital. <clears throat> I didn't have any other questions. Any other board members have anything for Director Lindbergh? I don't Great. have a question, okay. but I, I wanted to just say thanks to Sarah and the team because this is uh, an incredible tool. I, I, yeah, I, I think we still need to try to find the forest, but <laughs> we've got more trees. <laughs> I assume I'm going to have questions over time as we get into individual cases. So, um, but thank you so much. I mean, this is a, a heavy lift and super helpful. 
I think this is going to help, as you said, generate a lot of conversation and, and knowledge. Great. Well, we'll give you ourselves a 19 minute break. We'll be back at 10. Um, and thank you very much, Sal, for all of this great effort. See you soon. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you.
as you know, in our budgets, um, albeit it's, it's a small operating gain, but our, our hope is a transition in 2024 to a um, back to a 1% margin. And in, and in 2025, is a, is our plan is to work on getting back to where we have been historically, which is in a range of 3%, so in a, a range which we feel is for non for profits, that is a spot that we need to be in. We're also looking to improve on patient access with a particular uh, focus on primary care. And we'll talk more about that. And, um, and we're looking to continue to pursue opportunities to reduce health care costs uh, and at the same time improve patient outcomes. And, and we will we'll continue to pursue our initiatives that has allowed us to just recently become a, a CMS five star hospital. We are striving for our, our sixth consecutive nursing magnet designation that will be coming up in the near future. Um, we're trying to continue our designation as a leapfrog A-rated hospital for patient safety, which we, we are right now, and, um, and trying to build on our American Hospital Association national recognition for, for um, leadership and community collaboration all very important initiatives for us to be um, um, a successful, sustainable healthcare hospital. Um, our strategy um, is to reduce patient out, make, out migration and to facilitate Vermonters to receive more healthcare locally. Um, as um, our experience and our data shows us, as people leave our region and go outside our region for healthcare, especially to other states, they typically it costs the, the system and Vermonters more money, and, and we think we can provide care at a more cost-effective uh, level and, and at a high quality locally. Our, our vision is to transform um, SVMC into a regional referral hospital in the DH system. And um, as, we, as we take on that, um, that planning uh, task, we're going to focus initially on the following services over the next um, few years, looking to expand our regional oncology services um, as, a, as, a, as a key strategy. We're looking to develop, uh, continue to develop our cardiology services and transform them into cardiovascular program, which will, which will be a more extensive program for our community. We're looking to strengthen and diversify our surgical services. Uh, we certainly provide, I think, solid services, but we don't have the depth to allow people to stay local, and that's our, our goal. And, and clearly, our, our probably our, our top priority is to expand and promote primary care. Um, I, I would like to ask um, Kathy Fisher, who I thought is important for the for the board to hear from our our volunteer leader from the community, to take a moment to talk about the board's rationale. To, as for us to become part of the Dartmouth Health System. So Kathy, could you join in? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Tom. And thank you, Chair Foster, for this opportunity for discussion. Um, you know, as, as Tom said, we've had uh, a lot to be proud of at SBAC over the past 12, 15 years. We've had repetitive awards for our quality of care. I'm now. sorry, Ms. Fisher, sorry. I missed all the first half of that. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Maybe if you're not speaking, could you mute your uh, microphone? Uh, thank you, Ms. Fisher. Apologies. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, great. I'll, I'll lean forward a bit. So I just say thank, thank you. you for the opportunity for this discussion. Um, and as Tom said, we at SBMC have had a long track record of success. We've been recognized for the quality of our care. We've had a strong balance sheet stable margins until um, the recent period. Um, but as our board looked ahead during the 20 teams, all the issues that we've been discussing today were clearly visible. Our aging demographics, a population that needed more, more services, um, and also the drug addiction problems and mental health problems that have affected families so significantly. At the same time, um, the problem the Northeast has had about attracting, the Northeast New England has had in attracting doctors has really become a national problem. And you could see that we were competing nationally for doctors much more than in the past. And of course, after COVID, the staffing shortages have been quite stunning across up and down our organization. 
So we thought about all the ways we could improve uh, how we provide extra care, increased services without increasing costs. And we have been working with partners um, in the local area for things on mental health, for example. But the uh, opportunity to merge with an academic medical center, in our view, really would be the best way to provide the breadth and depth of services we want for our community without substantially increasing costs. And Dartmouth to us turned to be the, we think the very best partner. We knew Dartmouth well, our doctors had worked with them for uh, like 10, 12 years um, in an affiliation relationship. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at their system, how they run their health system. And what we could see was that um, their interests are very aligned with ours. They understand rural health care, obviously, but they have increasing demand for critical care services. And therefore, it behooves them to preserve their bed capacity for critical care. And as Tom said, have SDMC provide more uh, primary and secondary services to our community so that we're not sending people there as much, but rather doing things in the local community to, to provide things um, right, right there. With oncology having huge demand from our, 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 our base um, and cardiology services as well, those are the first things we're focusing on, but others as well. And the idea of providing local care is has been very much embraced in our community because people have been traveling outside and the more we can do, um, the better the outcomes will be uh, for our community. We also want to lever the um, expertise that DH has in areas that we don't. For example, um, psychiatry. Uh, again, a very significant need in our community now and we are actually working with the state uh, to assess the feasibility of providing an inpatient adolescent mental health care facility where DH psychiatry would be the um, provider uh, on that score, and but we would be actually having the facility at our hospital. But there's no magic bullet to any of this. Um, we, we, we know, Dartmouth knows, that there's just a ton of blocking and tackling that has to be done. But an advantage of the system is that sharing best practices is a real opportunity. Um, and I'll have to say on our side, one of the things that we've talked about a great deal with Dartmouth and others is um, how we have retained our nursing staff through the pandemic, um, which as you all know, has been an incredible challenge. Um, and it's not just money, um, it's, it's a lot of cultural um, management um, through our, our, our really terrific team head, headed by Pam Duchesne, where we've, we've really empowered our nursing staff to, um, to, to lead and take on roles and, and to make sure they're getting the career development and the input that gives them, I think, much better job satisfaction than they might get elsewhere. And, and, and as you all know, um, working in a hospital now is a very challenging endeavor. Um, workplace violence is not something most people ever signed up for. So we really take it very seriously that we have to hear our employees and what what we can do to help them to get through a, a, a much more challenging time than they ever would have expected. And I think that's been a really important um, con contribution to how we've kept our high quality staff and maintained high quality services uh, in a cost controlled way. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but say, as Tom said, we're looking forward to an ongoing evolution um, and we fully appreciate that um, for the system to do well, all the members need to do well and vice versa. So it's a, it's a, it'll be a very integrated effort going forward and one that we think will really help us to provide more and better services locally without um, taking on significant additional costs. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. And um, as Kathy indicated, I think we, we believe our integration with um, Dartmouth Health will create additional operating efficiencies. And over time will assist us to better control healthcare costs. Um, it's gonna help us in an area that we all struggle with in rural Vermont and other rural areas of scale, uh, which is oftentimes the missing element in the operations of rural healthcare institutions. Through joint purchasing and, and supply chain opportunities, 
implementation of shared services and a, and a, and a great example which is going to help us is the implementation of a shared IT system um, with Dartmouth Health. Um, they will allow us to expand um, and make more sophisticated our physician practice support, which is certainly a, a bedrock to our, to our future operation. And it will create a, additional administrative savings. And, and I think this is a strategy that will help us to become more co cost effective, the cost of insurance, uh, the cost of financing, and executive overhead. Um, you know, as you, as you look at these organizations, our organization, um, you know, we have an overhead which over time is, is expensive. And we think moving into a system creates an ability for us to do a couple of things. One is to certain positions now will be handled at a corporate level, not at our level. And, and that will allow us to reduce um, certain executive uh, positions. Um, and, and the type of individuals that we need to recruit from my position on down over time, when you're part of a larger system, you can, um, you look for a different skill set. You look for people who maybe who can be earlier on in their career have up and coming high potential, but don't have the, the you know, 20, 25 years of experience that oftentimes you have, oftentimes you pay for. So, so we think it's a, it's a, it's a exciting opportunity for us to recalibrate and to become more effective uh, with the strength of a system behind us that has a, a great deal of intellectual capital as well as some resources. So um, these are not easy decisions to make. I mean, this is, you know, we've had a hundred years of, of, I think, you know, pretty, pretty good success at SVMC on our own, but we think working together in this environment for us, and every, in every community is different, but for us makes the most sense. And with our continued mission to provide exceptional and accessible care, and, and Kathy talk, talked about it, the two examples, which is driven both by our board's commitment and the, and the relationship at Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock Medical Center is, as Kathy said, one is on the mental health side, which is a service that most hospitals would not be looking to jump into during a time of fiscal challenges, but uh, but the provision of uh, both inpatient and outpatient adolescent services is a huge community need that our board has indicated is a commitment we need to go after. And, and we are focusing on that, working closely with the state as a partner to try to make that happen. And the other area I just want to quickly mention is um, the strategy to expand primary care, which is another huge issue that's facing us as well as the rest of the state. And maybe I can ask Dr. Trey Dobson who's our chief medical officer, just to comment about our strategy in the primary care market. So Trey? Sure, well, the first that you would have noticed in, in the write-up is to try to increase access now in our own, in our own system without uh, the time it will take to build out primary care. So we're doing that. You know, we're doing it with things that you've heard about, using scribes to help make the efficiency of the physicians and advanced practice providers um, better. We're doing things like uh, having staff prepare the charts ahead of time, which you may think uh, doesn't add much, but it adds tremendous amount. It means that the doctor or the nurse practitioner doesn't have to gather a bunch of information before or after they see the patient, that it's all categorized into one container. And we believe we can increase the access through primary care but around 15 percent, um, between 12 and 17 percent, just with those initiatives alone. We started those in April and we're over 5% now, so I think we're well on our way uh, to increase in that. But the long term is different. So we have two main things we're looking at. One is to um, really open an additional practice and bring in new advanced practice providers who are right out of training and have physicians and uh, experienced advanced practice providers mentor them, you know, not take on a full patient population, uh, almost like additional training. Why that's important is we actually receive lots, I mean, a significant amount of CVs from an interest from new nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, but they have very little experience and that has been worsened by the pandemic because their clinical experience is really less. They've done a lot of online training, but they don't have that patient, um, they don't have that patient encounter background. 
and they say it right off the bat. They say, who's going to support me? Um, and when we don't give good support, it's just it's not good for the patient, but it's certainly not good for them. And you see a high turnover rate. So we're starting that now in uh, 2023, 2024. And then uh, also the planning for the family medicine residency. And this would be uh, will be a very big lift. Um, it's going to be a large initiative. It's going to take um, uh, hands on deck. We think it's the right thing to do. We've got a lot of support from the public uh, and from our physicians and nurses to get this going. It's not as easy as just setting up an office and recruiting in residents. It's much, much more difficult than that. And I think many of you probably know that. Uh, there's a lot of competition between residencies and you have to do it right. So we're either gonna do it right or we won't do it. And uh, the answer is we'll do it right. And I'm happy to take questions on that now or throughout the session. And, and just to add to that, we could not do either of these two services on our own. I mean, the, the need for an academic partner to be successful in the mental health area, especially with, um, with physician um, coverage and physician direction, and in the fact that the training program would come under a, a Dart, Dartmouth sponsorship, which would make it critical for us to be able to recruit residents. So um, we, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and we welcome your questions regarding our 2024 budget submission and, and I'd also um, pass it on to Steve Majetic who will help facilitate the, the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Well, um, Tom, I think I'm going to hand it off to Sarah, correct? Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, things, no worries. Uh, I, have, I have no additional comments on the, on the overview, but uh, uh, so I'll hand it off to Sarah and then uh, after your presentation, Sarah will uh, take questions. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we'll kind of be having a dialogue as we go along here. So uh, I'm just uh, just restricting to kind of PPS hospitals. We see that your budget comes in uh, just above that benchmark, uh, which uh, was impressive given given the expenses uh, associated with increasing the access, as you just detailed uh, for us. Um, and noticing that uh, the expense growth, uh, despite those enhancements, um, is below, uh, you know, the and the revenue growth expectation. So, um, I think that's uh, just notably impressive. So, want to flag that uh, for folks. Um, and let's just let's get into it. So. Um, I think you highlighted this. Some of the plans for uh, increasing access uh, include the primary care and the oncology and cardiology services. Uh, and wondering, um, you know, you highlighted how AHA has historically, or you've gotten accolades for your community um, collaboration. I'm just curious how you approach that process and how that affects kind of the decisions um, for the infrastructure you do invest in. Is that a question? Yeah. Yep, that's a question. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, maybe uh, initially, I mean, you know, Sarah and, and the board, we, um, we very seriously take community collaboration as an institutional priority. And actually, it was one of our one of our strategic initiatives is creating critical partnerships. And, um, and we have formed a, in, in a large group of organizations that we meet with every month. And there's up to, I think, up to 25 organizations that are in this group that we sit down and we talk about um, healthcare issues, social determinants of health. And we don't just talk about hospitals. We talk about the healthcare needs of the community and how we can all work together and um, we've hired individuals who help, help facilitate that process. And, um, and I think we, we have a philosophy that the hospital should not dominate these discussions. The hospital has to help facilitate and be part of it, but to work with the, with, um, um, the community organizations and non-for-profits, uh, physician groups to try to solve these issues together. And uh, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a challenging process to go through, but it's one which we think it's um, it serves the basis for a, a very, I think, fruitful relationships in building one of trust and collaboration, which for us seems to work. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and could you uh, help us understand which uh, ACO programs you're planning to participate in uh, in fiscal year 24? So uh, Sarah and the ACO will be um, in the Medicare Medicaid. 
Uh, we saw a drop. Um, one of the uh, questions we got was why did our uh, fixed perspective payment um, uh, numbers go down? It's because of the elimination of Blue Cross because we were in the Blue Cross uh, model and Blue Cross is uh, withdrawn, but we, we were uh, one of the first uh, to be in the Blue Cross and you now Blue Cross is withdrawn. So uh, it's the Medicare, Medicaid, and I believe that there's a small piece of MVP, but MVP mm -hmm. is, is not a substantial driver uh, uh, for us in, uh, in, in our region. Wonderful. Um, and sorry, I had the wrong hospital up there. So, um, and okay. uh, we are rounding till, to, it is 8.96. I know that that eight is nice to see. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so no, I think conversation with you would be complete without understanding um, how you've been so successful in navigating the traveler expenses. And, you know, if you could just share some things that you find have been particularly effective in managing that um, very challenging expense. So I'll, I'll defer to Tom on that one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. And let me just, um, you know, this is, this is a, a challenging issue and it, it, it does vary by community. So each community is different on this. I mean, let me, let me just talk about our philosophy here and our philosophy. And, and, uh, and we were challenged. We said, let's try to figure out ways of how we can incentivize our existing staff to stay and, and to stay with us and to uh, meet the needs of our of our patients. I mean, we had a, we have a, a tremendously talented clinical staff here. We're blessed by that. And so we came up with through our human resources, our nursing department, our physician groups. We came up with different structures of how we could create incentive arrangements, especially in our high areas of vulnerability, to keep staff here. Um, and I think we were successful. And we said, let's try not to hire travelers. Um, again, and, and we also, you know, we have, we're, we are in a non-unionized environment, so that gives us some additional flexibility to, to do creative things. And, and we were able to create a number of creative pay arrangements. But I have to say, Sarah, the most important initiative is a leadership that was provided by our nursing executive management team, which um, led by Pam Duchesne, Dr. Duchesne, and, and she, um, took the philosophy of all nurses don their, their scrubs and they come to work, including yourself every day in scrubs and they work the floors wherever the need is. And we, you know, and, and Pam as an example, she would, she would work night shifts, she would work evening shifts, she would help fill in. And I'm not saying that's a sustainable model for the future, but for us, it sent a strong message to our team that management is there with you. We have your back. And we're going to work with you. And, and her entire team took on that philosophy, working side by side by our other clinicians. And that had a tremendous impact and an influence on our, on our nursing team. And um, so we were, you know, we, we were very successful. Uh, I think for the majority of the, of the pandemic, we had zero travelers. Uh, we had to bring in a couple of, on the insular areas that were very, very small departments, one and two people. When we lost someone, we were, we had to, you know, bring in a specialist to help cover. But I think that was the approach, the philosophy of working together in, in to kind of create a, a magnet moment with our team to say, you know, we're all in this. And um, everyone worked hard. We, we were all very, they were all very tired, but we tried to support them in every way we could. Sarah, I'm just going to throw one more thing in too. Um, we also uh, very, very early in, in 2020, um, focused on staff safety and transparency and um, very frequent messaging to staff. And I do think that provided some assurance that they that their colleagues at other locations weren't seeing um, that came all from leadership and then all through middle management and down to staff themselves. And, you know, most organizations eventually adopted that, uh, but I think doing it early, you know, gave some confidence to the staff. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Uh, the other uh, question I had uh, is you are projecting a reduction in FT slight from uh, 820 down to 811. Just curious um, if you could give us a little more context about kind of the thinking in those positions. So, so most of those positions, Sarah, are in administrative areas, uh, not patient care areas. Um, we, we looked at, you know, uh, every year when we go through the budget, we look at all 800 plus FTEs. 
Okay, we have a workforce steering committee, and we look at them all and we say, what can we do without uh, without uh, jeopardizing uh, patient safety, patient throughput, uh, and and um, so um, we went through, uh, and uh, like I said, our workforce steering committee is very active, uh, and uh, we settled in on the uh, 811, um, and um, you know. I, I don't know what else to say is that, you know, we, we just keep looking for ways of of reducing FTEs because they're, you know, they're our, first of all, they're our biggest cost from, a, 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 you know, when you look at the, the people cost in, in the hospital. Um, but we got to remember that we're serving people, we're treating people, and uh, we, um, um, you know, we looked at every every position and um, we didn't want to jeopardize anything any costs, um, any patient safety issues, any throughput issues. Um, and uh, so we settled in on the 811. Uh, it's, a, it's a small decline of nine on, on, on 800, but uh, um, it didn't go up. And, you know, uh, I'm the CF no. Uh, that's, um, and uh, I always uh, try, you know, we, 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 we got to squeeze that. And the, and the team works really well together and they they monitor the FTEs and we a year over year we usually don't have too many variances but every once in a while we do but um, this was a, a concerted effort by um, all parties and, and, and Sarah, yeah. just add, add to that um, just one quick example and it's also it relates to systemness too is that we, we lost a talented um, chief compliance officer and um, who went to another institution and we, and we made a decision that we would not replace that position. We would move an existing person up, our risk manager, into that role. And we would use the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Compliance Service to help provide the oversight in, in, in direction that we, we feel we, we would need. So that's the system helped us in terms of saving an FTE position in terms of our oper a higher price FTE position, too, in our, in our system. That's a really helpful example. And um, just looking at this kind of, you've almost exactly kind of uh, managed to the employment cost index, um, which I think is a, a testament to um, how the effort that you put into managing and right sizing your um, staff. And I think uh, I'm just curious what, if anything, uh, might be changing in terms of the local control uh, with the changes in your relationship with Dartmouth uh, as it goes to compensation or other uh, factors that affect labor. So, so Tom, I'll let you uh, touch on that. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the, the philosophy of, of the operations on the DH system is that the system, the DH parent corp um, board, helps us set strategic direction on the, on the bigger issues, the clinical side, the running of the operations is, is really vested with each hospital. And that was very attractive for us. So we, we, have, to, we have to manage to our, or to our, our budget. We have to um, make those decisions. And um, so DH um, does not get involved in that day-to-day -day -day operations unless we ask them for assistance in terms of some um, consultative work on a, a, a you know particularly vexing issue, but by and large we have to manage it, and and we have to you know <laughs> kind of live with um, our budget projections and um, and and again we we find that as a, an attractive feature, not a, not a detriment. Thank you. Uh, I think that covers the questions that are coming from staff uh, at this point. If the board has any uh, questions specifically related to the labor expenses in the budget, uh, this would be a good time to fold those in. Um, sorry, Sal, do you want to do just labor or do you have, do you want to do all board questions at the end or by topic? Let's try and stay within the topic so we hopefully can reduce the cross-referencing. <laughs> Great, okay, all right. Um, any board member questions? This is Robin, hi all. Um, I just had a follow-up on the discussion that we just had around the FTEs. Um, would you expect, I know you talked, Tom, about how the DH affiliation will help and you gave us a good example. Are you expecting additional changes in the FTEs in the future as that affiliation comes to fruition? 
You know, Robin, um, I, I, we will have changes because, for instance, I believe we'll start some some new service lines that we've never had in the past. You know, an example is, is mental health. Um, that that is something that we we have not we have we are not licensed for mental health services. Uh, I know we had to go through a whole Green Mountain Care review, so that's I'm not taking that for granted. But if that's approved, that would be a, a new service line. Um, the development of the primary care teaching program would be a new service line too, in terms of um, a teaching program. Um, but I think there's other opportunity that would also create op, um, areas of potential shared services, both from, a, you know, I mentioned information technology. Um, I think there's opportunities in, in billing in the future. And that's something that we'll be talking about. I think the, there's um, certainly in our supply side, uh, I think there's opportunities to, to share there. So, I mean, one, one of the initiatives is that um, we come up with a shared services task force group that's being kind of run through DHSC. Where, where can we work together to um, create best practices and share our overhead and, and try to centralize if it makes sense? Thank you. And I just had one clarification question from your narrative. Um, related to labor expenses it's on page six um so on the top of page six you have a paragraph about position costs in fiscal year 24 are budgeted to go up a small amount in the scheme of things um, increasing access and throughput in the medical group is a significant driver in um, the two-year increase of costs um, and maybe, and I just was trying to reconcile this with the reduction in FTEs. And I think what I heard you say is that most of the reduction in FTEs were in admin. So uh, did, I just want to make sure I got that right. And if I was missing something, give you an opportunity to explain it. Yeah, R Robin, um, the, the FTEs are all administrative um, uh, FTEs. Um, and in the physician cost, uh, there is an increase in, in providers so we can improve the access. Uh, which, which accounts for a portion of the increase as well as um, additional compensation for that increased workload that the physicians are doing. But uh, to your question, they're all, they're non-physician um, and they're all um, administrative uh, type uh, personnel. Thank you. That, those were my questions about labor. Um, Any other? I have. Yeah, I have one or two. <clears throat> On the your approach to the nursing situation, um, when did you start uh, taking steps to to uh, end up where you are now, which is a pretty successful position? Tom. Um, okay. Does it? I'm sorry. Are you relating to the travelers? Um, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. Yeah, you described how there was some effort to uh, provide incentives to retain the nursing staff, and then there was some effort to uh, have some leadership working hand in glove with your nursing staff. And I'm wondering right. when that, when did you recognize that you needed to take steps to, to shore up the nursing staff? Yeah, very early on. Um, and, and actually, what was a what was a driver was we had concerns um, hearing from our staff members about a particular um, service in the hospital, one of the departments, a very critical department for us, that there was some discussions about nurses going um, into um, taking a traveler position, and that was the impetus for us to say, okay, we really need to think outside the box here. I mean, we we've had a lot of we've had years of different type of um, you know, arrangements and different type of strategies to keep nurses and recruit nurses. But this was something that was uh, very significant. So it was it was early on in the pandemic where we said we, we got to, you know, change the model, especially in from a standpoint of compensation. And um, and I, you know, and I think we we tried to, you know, we we're a small organization, so we were able to react pretty quickly on that. Um. Have any other Vermont hospitals 
you know, reached out to you to learn from the, the efforts you took to be so successful in this realm? Yeah, we we actually had had a number of discussions with with um, different Vermont hospitals and actually other hospitals outside of outside of Vermont who had heard about it. Um, so we 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 had we've had a, a fair number of discussions by institutions. And again, each 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 region and hospital is different. And um, but um, so we we've had those discussions and and, and certainly. Um, I, I can't, you know, speak more about the the, the nursing leadership that helped to drive this. Um, I have no other questions, but I, you know, recognize and want to commend you for keeping those costs down. It's it's great to hear that you were able to control FTEs without actually impacting patient care. Um, that's important, and you know, great job on the nursing front. Um, you should be commended for that. So thank you. Yeah. I have nothing no, thank, else. Thank you. Are there board questions related to the labor component of the submission that would help in your decision making? All right, uh, any questions from the healthcare advocate about uh, labor expense? No questions at this time, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so moving on to utilization. Uh, in my judgment, a bit of a humdinger for budgeting purposes between your efforts to reduce inpatient uh, utilization while also expanding uh, some of these service lines. So I wondered if you could just um, at a fairly high level just explain how you uh, went about budgeting related to utilization changes for 24. So so Sarah, um, what we did is we, we, we looked at our recent trends and we believe that um, as we improve access um, and pull patients back to um, our service area uh, who are now leaving, um, you know, hopefully we can keep the patients healthy and reduce uh, over time because this is not something that could just happen over one year, okay? Uh, this is something that will happen over time. Um, so what we did in, in, 20, in, 20, um, in the 24 budget uh, we kept our inpatient utilization flat because we do believe we'll start feeling some of the efforts of improving access, improving um, the health status of our uh, population through through the access uh, and pulling back out migration. But, um, um, you know, it, I know people would want us to see that inpatient utilization go down uh, because of that, but it's going to take time. So as we get more data, we'll be able to um, look at that and possibly on our core business as we have today, maybe it will go down. But as Tom said, we're also looking to improve services um, because um, if we improve services, we may actually see that decline negated because we're keeping patients um, local. Um, so we, de we decided to take what I consider a conservative approach and, and be flat because there's a lot of moving parts there that um, uh, can drive it either way. And, and we'll see if we're right a year from now. Um, and, and, and if we improve the access and, and, and we treat patients uh, in the office and reduce, but as we're working with Dartmouth, we'll, we'll then see uh, some improved services, which will probably bring it up. So. From a budgeting perspective, we, flat, we felt flat was um, a logical way to do it, and we'll evaluate it over time, um, just like we've done in the past, uh, and uh, and see where we end up. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, apparently, my filter is broken, so I don't see your ED utilization here. It was old anyway, so uh, we'll get that well, fixed. Our, yeah, our, our ED <laughs> utilization uh, is also flat. Um, because, um, you know, ED utilization, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we didn't put in our narrative, um, we're in the, well, we did put it that we're in the middle of this ED modernization project, but uh, there is some um, thought that people um, may want to come just to see it, okay, and not for a visit, you know, you know, <laughs> just to go through it. Uh, a couple other hospitals that did new EDs um, saw an upclick in the first year or so, um, in, in, in it, so we didn't factor that into our budget, but we kept it flat. And and over time, um, 
hopefully we can reduce that. But again, it's one of those balancing acts as we improve access, because access is not going to not going to drive those decisions people make like that. It's going to be, right. as Trey pointed out, we're, we're at 5%, we're moving to the 10%, then the 15%. It's going to be a gradual. I think 2025, we'll, we'll be able to, we'll have a year's worth of data underneath that will see the impact and we'll be able to measure it much better. Trey, I don't know if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a little bit of rolling the dice, uh, I don't know, making some project projections with a blindfold. Because as we increase access in primary care, the hope is that you keep people healthier, they don't go into heart failure, uh, and they don't therefore need to be admitted to the hospital. But at the same time, you know, we transfer a lot of people out for things that can be done in a community hospital. Um, ERCP, for example, which is, you know, help, helping uh, to help with a gallbladder attack. Um, uh, mild heart attacks, things that can stay in a community hospital if you have the resources and services to do so. And we know that we have those patients. We know we transfer them out. They go to Albany, and we just saw uh, an hour ago how expensive it is to be an inpatient in, in Albany. And we sh that shouldn't happen. We should keep people here, um, and, and we need those services. You know, cutting those services uh, doesn't decrease costs at all for Vermonters. In fact, it, it increases, and I can you know, I'll argue that over and over. And then lastly, um, there is a distribution need in the, in the state as well as in, in, in our Dartmouth Health System, and that distribution needs to make sure that beds are being utilized appropriately, and we're available to uh, have patients that can't get into other facilities. You know, that is a problem. So balancing all of those variables, we came up with a, a flat 0% change, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I'm just curious uh, if you uh, formally track uh, what we think of in the policy world as potentially avoidable uh, ED utilization, and uh, if so, uh, or if not, why not? Uh, if so, how you kind of approach that? Trey, you want to take a shot at that in the ED? Yeah, we do. We you, don't have you the... also. You also um, work in our ED. You're an ED physician by training, and you work at. You currently continue to work in, as an ED physician. Um, so go ahead. Right. So I work half time here and half time at the academic center at DHMC. So I do get a little bit of a, a perspective there. We do, Sarah. I think Sarah asked, asked the question. Um, yeah. We do. We use a couple of standard um, metrics that probably you know David's aware of. I can't even remember the names of them right now. And they they come basically from claims data, insurance data. I have to tell you, I, I want to follow them. I want to give them the worth. I don't believe in them very much. They they just use um, diagnosis codes. For example, sore throat is listed as something that's an avoidable emergency department visit. Uh, most of the sore throats that I see, uh, and this is true because I work in an ED, not in urgent care, and we do have an urgent care that sees minor sore throats. The sore throats I see need to be in the emergency department. So excluding them as as a you know avoidable, it just doesn't make sense. Another one is headache. You know, often headache is listed. So I I, I don't want to go back and forth on that, but we try to follow those metrics. I will say um, our throughput in our ED. And our numbers, the reason they have slowed a bit or leveled is because we have an urgent care that now has higher volumes and sees uh, much less sick people. So most people that come into the ED at SVMC are now are now um, much higher medical need than they were when I started here in, in 2005. Yeah, and I would just say the data certainly bears that out, that um, DRG severity has been creeping up across the country. So um, not not just in folks' heads, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, the other question that I had, um, and you know, now that you're a short timer, maybe you can share some of your secrets here, Mr. Majetic, but um, it's clear that you do uh, are in, in, uh, have some initiatives to increase pr productivity. Um, you talked about kind of getting charts set up for providers and whatnot. Um, what sort of tools do you use when measuring that, and uh, how do you kind of assess uh, relative success? So we're going to, um, we just instituted a, a new set of dashboards by, um, you know, and, and we kind of like take a, a pyramid approach. At the top is the whole practice, uh, and then we go down and, and we, you know, and I'll use, um, I'll use our Northshire um uh, site as an example, and then we look at Northshire as a practice, that's in Manchester, uh, and then we go down to the individual provider. 
So we, 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 we look at all those dashboards, um, and on the dashboard, it will, it'll have uh, panel size. It has visits. It has uh, – what else does it have, Trey? I'm, I'm coming up blank. Um, it, has, it, it has RVU data. RVU data, yep, yep. yep. And, then, and then we've um, got separate, not right on the dashboard, but right behind it, um, patient experience data. Yes. So, you know, we'll be looking and we have benchmarks set uh, that, that the, all the providers have agreed to. Uh, and, you know, while we will be looking at them as we're, you know, and Trey said we're at the 5%, you know, increase mark. So we're seeing successes. The, the, the quarter from July to October, we're looking to get to that 10%. And then in the 24 budget year, we're going to be in that 15%. So those dashboards, and they'll be, they'll be I'll say, we'll have some successes. And we'll probably have some uh, people underperforming or practices underperforming. We'll have to take corrective action and find and find the, the cause and effect if they're not performing. And, and hopefully, if one practice is doing better, we can learn from that practice, um, best practices. So uh, we, we have a lot of data flying around, uh, but, but we are using sort of like, like I like to call the pyramid effect. We start, we, you know, you either work from your top down or you can go from the bottom up, depending on how you want to look at it. Thank you. Uh, and I was also curious if you don't mind sharing, uh, as you look at, you know, do you have like benchmarks like for visits per day or is it, you know, is that yes. like, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Visits per day, visits per week, you know, you know, remember people, you know, physicians do take vacations. So, you know, sometimes you got, you know, you, you see one physician, he's doing well, and then all of a sudden he drops off. Well, you got to look, you know, he's on vacation, he took a day off or whatever. But we have a visit per day target. We have a visit per month target, you know, so so we'll be looking at it, you know. And, and you know, when you start looking at an individual day, it, it, it's so that's too micro. You got to look at the long haul. Okay, and then we look at the weekly, we look at the month, and then uh, ultimately, you know, we'll be looking at quarters and then year. And the success will be, the success will really be, um, you know, we'll really start getting a feel uh, when we get our first quarter under our belt, uh, and then our second quarter, and we hit that, we hit that uh, uh, fifteen percent increase over the long haul. Uh, yep. And how are the benchmarks derived for those targets? How are they derived? Well, we're using national uh, national benchmarks, um, and uh, we're using. Um, Trey, I think three three standards. Uh, well, right. Um, it it kind of depends on what measurement you're talking about, because some of the me you know some of the resources are good with certain measurements and not others. And you know, it, it's actually a little complex there. You have to make sure you're looking at like institutions. So having uh, an academic center compared to a community hospital is not correct because of residents' involvement and all that. But we use a blended survey for every single one of those and for panel size. Um, for the primary care. You know, the goal, I just have to point out, since it's a public forum, the goal is not to see who's who's performing poorly. Uh, the goal is to see where are the opportunities to have everyone performing at a comfortable level that is good for their well-being and improves access. And that's the approach we've taken, and we have much better buy-in than if we, you know, did it in some other way. I, I know that that goes without saying, but it, I think it's important to point out. And it, it actually is really good to compare office sites because if you have four primary care office sites that, you know, maybe you've um, uh, adjusted a little bit for the type of patients they're seeing, but, you know, they should be pretty similar. And when they're not, one can learn from the other. Um, we can learn from the other. So that, that type of learning. And I think that's what Steve's talking about with the pyramid uh, measurements. Absolutely. And I guess uh, to be clear, like, are you looking for median generally? Or are you, how do you kind of set your relative performance uh, targets? Yeah. I can answer that as well. Um, so utilize it. So it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about RVU, um, we have less than median because Vermont is a lower utilization state. So we don't want to be Florida. Um, that's overutilization. Uh, but we also want to make sure that that utilization is at a certain level because that reflects access and reflects uh, volume. So that's why it's not just one measurement we follow. We follow the panel size. You know, typically we follow a lot of things, but what's really out there on that on that dashboard that Steve was talking about is panel size. If we're talking about primary care here, panel size, um, visits per day, 
uh, total visit volume per month adjusted for FTE, and then RVU productivity as well as patient experience. Thank you. Uh, very clear, very uh, obvious how you attend to that. <laughs> uh, and then I was also curious, um, you know, you mentioned all the efforts to, you know, review uh, inpatient admissions, make sure they're appropriate, it's the right answer for that case, uh, efforts to shift more care to patients' homes and, and alternate settings. Um, and just uh, as you like work through this, I think broader transformation process, um, just curious like where you're kind of finding some pain points and um, what you think you're um, already kind of paying off in terms of uh, the results. So Trey, I'll let you um, take that and then I can follow up. Sure, that'd be great. Well, first off, just on admissions, um, you know, we have uh, the physician's decision, which actually does trump all depending on the medical assessment. Then we follow what are called interqual criteria. Most people are probably familiar with that. There are some other benchmarks, but, um, uh, you know, allowing whether or not a patient uh, can be admitted to hospital on observation or inpatient. Um, and then, you know, we also work with DHMC to make sure we're aligned uh, with uh, metrics throughout the entire Dartmouth Health System. But you asked about pain points, and, and I'm going to say the same pain points that I think you're going to hear from all, you know, the, of the community hospitals here. And that is, it's, it's not really admissions, it's discharges. Um, it's so difficult right now um, getting patients to psychiatric facilities. So they end up, to tell you the truth, they end up often going to a suboptimal environment. And that is really hard on the well-being of the nursing and physician staff uh, because they know they are not doing the patient and uh, you know, doing what's really in their best interest. They've, they're doing what, it's not the path of least resistance by any means, but it's the path of best resistance at that, I mean, uh, best uh, path for that particular you know, moment in time because the other options aren't there. And it's the same with the, um, you know, patients going to skilled nursing facilities. I, I'll say it. I know that you've heard it. It's real. Um, we have patients waiting for so long uh, that they, they really should not be in the hospital. And it's not good for them. It's not good for staff. That's one of the biggest pain points we have. Transportation as well, um, getting patients to uh, uh, tertiary care centers and to skilled nursing facilities is, is a real problem. So another pain point um, on the administrative side is that, as Trey said, the physician believes the patient needs to be uh, admitted. Um, the patient meets qual care, um, um, in a qual criteria, sorry, uh, in a qual uh, criteria. Uh, and then a month later, after we bill it, uh, we get a denial. Um, and those denials have increased, which is increasing uh, an administrative burden. Um, and you know it's it's it, it's a difficult time, and we understand what the insurance companies you know what they need to do, but um, as Trey said, the, it starts with the physician making the decision on the front line, and then if it's validated, um, you know we have some difficult times, and we spend a lot of money and time uh, working, and sometimes we take the physician away from the patients uh, because they got to get on the phone with the insurance companies. To justify their decision, uh, and and so so there's a lot, uh, and we've seen a, a significant increase in in the workload uh, related to retrospective denials. Um, so, another pain point. Uh, thank you very much. And then I'm um, always interested in uh, the validity of our information. So I uh, was curious uh, how well our migration information uh, might tie to what you see in your data. Probably easier to um, look at it from the <laughs> in migration than the out. That's a little harder for you. Uh, but uh, just see, like do these uh, kind of magnitudes uh, feel reasonable? Are we totally m missing the mark on some of these measures? Or I don't know how close he had a chance to review. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, Sarah, I didn't have a um, that much. We haven't reviewed this chart much, but uh, let me just give you a perspective. Um, about 22% of our net patient service revenues comes from the state of New York. Uh, that's based upon cash collections. That's internal data. Um, and about um, almost 9% of our uh, cash collections comes from uh, the state of Massachusetts. Um, and, um, and then 2% comes from um, every place else. 
uh, and then uh, the remaining are, are Vermonters. This is based upon uh, the address that the patient gives us um, when we register them. And uh, the payer mix, um, the interesting thing is when we look at the payer mix uh, for both New York State and Massachusetts, the payer mix is much more favorable towards commercial patients. And, and why is that? Um, that's because Massachusetts Medicaid and New York Medicaid don't want their Medicaid patients crossing the border. Okay, uh, in Massachusetts in particular, they have an ACO in, in Berkshire County, um, and those patients, um, you know, unless it's emergent care, uh, have to uh, stay in Berkshire County or, or, or Massachusetts. So, um, and, uh, and we continue to work on that. You know, we are to a good, um, to half of Berkshire County, we're the closest hospital. Um, so we have challenges. Um, uh, with that. And in New York, it's the same thing. Um, you know, New York, um, um, this is my second hospital working, um, you know, uh, on the border of New York state and, and New York Medicaid is clear, stay in inside of New York state if you can. So that's what drives when you look at the payer mix from out of state, it's, it's much more favorable. That's because we have a lower Medicaid. And when you start using percentages, you have to be careful. Um, yeah. but, uh, that, that is, um, uh, clear. Okay. So, um, Word. so we can, if, if, if there's a need, we can go through and, and look at this data, uh, more closely, but, um, uh, we've been tracking this, um, for almost as long as I've been at SVMC based upon cash collections, uh, you know, uh, inpatient, outpatient and, um, uh, you know, we we saw an increase uh, many years ago uh, from Massachusetts when a local hospital closed, a small uh, regional hospital, and we've seen um, it, it increasing. The other thing that we look at is our inpatient, um, outpatient, uh, and physician practice mix. And when you, when you look at our hospital, we are a much different hospital than than when I arrived uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, we were we were about 30 percent inpatient volume. Uh, from a cash collections perspective, uh, let's, let's call it 2010. Uh, we are now 81% of our business, uh, um, and that's cash collections, is, um, is from the outpatient uh, or physician practice. Uh, so you can see the change in, in, um, in the organization. And I think that's a credit to our physicians, and I think uh, some of the things we're talking about, well, improving access, um, uh, we, we may see um, some increases in outpatient, but as we get more services, we'll then see some increase in, in inpatient, and, and it'll all get smashed together, and our percentages may change slightly. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Ha always happy to get better uh, feedback on the our blind spot, so we can take that offline. Uh, but if the board has any other questions related to utilization, uh, we'll ask those now, please. I have a couple, but I'm not sure if others want to go first. Chair Foster, what's your pleasure? No, go go ahead. OK, please. great. Thank you. Um, so thank you all. You know, your presentations are always really helpful, and this utilization question is one that um, uh, Director Limber mentioned already, but I, I just want to probe a little bit deeper into the, you know, this idea that you're trying, you're you're trying to reduce some of the out migration. Um, you're increasing your scope of services. You're adding cardio. You're adding uh, ortho uh, capacity, surgery capacity, and you're keeping your inpatient assumption um, flat and your ED assumption flat, even though you're you're expanding access to primary care. So I just I guess my first question is, did you do any type of uh, sensitivity analysis on these utilization assumptions, modeling ranges of, you know, likely ranges of inpatient and ED as you're trying to increase access and increase scope, just to get a ballpark figure of what NPR could potentially look like if your uh, assumptions here are off? So, uh, Jessica, we, uh, um, one of the things that, um, I was really, uh, I wanted to be cautious of, is I, I didn't want to um, over project, because you know, as, as we start increasing these services, they're not gonna start overnight, okay? And, and so 
I didn't want to over project those. Um, and then improving access also should decrease, hopefully, our ED visits and our admissions as we get people into the practices. And as Trey said, you know, we, we, we see them, we can prevent. So we need to get some better data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had a study done over a year ago uh, that uh, working with Dartmouth uh, when we were evaluating the affiliation with an outside firm that shows that there is opportunity for us, but we don't have those services and those things in place yet. The one place that we do have probably some um, opportunity sooner is an oncology as we saw in the narrative, that we're going to be fully staffed um, in, in oncology. We're going to have two physicians and one associate provider. We haven't had that since way before the pandemic. Okay, so we will probably pull some of that outpatient back, and then there may be some surgeries and some other inpatient services. But it takes time, and the, and the study that we did with Dartmouth shows it out in 25, 26, and 27. So, um, you know, and, and we have some projections that, that and we're going to be refining them um, after, after this whole budget presentation, um, you know, and, and time uh, when we submit some COMs uh, related to our um, uh, adolescent psych, um, that, that you'll probably see some of that. But we still, um, we need to be cautious for 24 because things are just at its infancy. And I, again, I didn't want to um, overshoot um, or undershoot. Okay, so let me, I, I totally understand that. There's a lot of moving parts here and predicting utilization is always a challenge, but certainly when you're adding different services and trying to do uh, increasing access in primary care while at the same time adding more sur uh, surgical and other specialty capacity, the net effect is hard to predict. I understand that. Yes. Um, so let me ask you this then, if your utilization assumptions turn out to be underestimates, particularly on the inpatient side, would SVMC consider a mid-year downward adjustment in commercial rate? Uh, you know, in other words, to keep the NPR whole, if your utilization turns out to be higher than you anticipated, that would keep the budget whole, but give uh, commercial rate payers some relief. Is that something that's in your consideration for this year? We We've always, um, um, Tom and I have always discussed um, as we start going through the year, the impact on that, on the, on the commercial rate. Uh, a couple years ago, we were, we were a little behind uh, and we were thinking about coming in. We discussed it, we modeled some things and, uh, and, it, and it came in. So we're constantly, um, at least the past years, constantly looking at we got a rate increase of X. Okay, what's happening? Okay, one of the things that, that has happened in the past, just using the past as an example, Jessica, is that um, we have seen also a greater increase in our Medicare uh, patients, which takes away from, from um, the, the NPR, uh, as Sarah dis uh, distributed. But we always evaluate what we got what we need, where we are, and what we think is going to happen in the future. Uh, and, and I think 24 uh, and the beginning of 25, there's going to be a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts. So we, we're always evaluating it. Got it. All right. Um, and, and actually, this is just related to the utilization. This has to do with uh, the avoidable utilization and Dr. Dobson, I completely appreciate your concerns about how do you measure it appropriately. You know, there are certainly people that come in that it might appear as if it's an avoidable visit, but in fact it wasn't. Um, and but I excellent, you know, as I look at this, you know, emergency department utilization, 11% of the ED admits were admitted. Does that seem like a high number, low number? Is that a number that you would target? Is that a, is that a proxy for um, anything related to avoidable utilization, avoidable visits, as you look at that chart? That, yeah, we, that, well, we typically, um, and Jessica, I can't quote where this comes from, but you, you look at, um, rural versus inner city, and then you look at academic versus um, 
community hospitals. So 15%, 16% is what it was when I started here. Um, and we want to keep it, you know, around that and slightly less would be would be um, good. For an academic center, inner city hospital, you know, those numbers are in the 30s, 30, 35 percent. Um, but that's not the, the, you know, the situation we have here. And unfortunately, you know, some of that doesn't include some of the transfer um, situations we have where patients get transferred to uh, tertiary care. And that is actually slightly increased. Um, and as we go through the numbers, just to head off another question, why did it increase? Uh, and it's not just this year. It actually increased for a variable reasons. One is standards of care. So multi-organ trauma no longer stays at a, church, at a community hospital. It hasn't for about five to 10 years. The literature supports it needs to be at an academic center. Um, minor heart attacks, which I mentioned earlier, there was a big push in the mid uh, 2000s that th those all need to go to uh, academic centers or cath cath uh, capable centers. We're hoping that'll that seems to be a waste, and I think that the literature is turning that around. But to back to your question, um, you know, 11, 11 to 15 percent seems to be a, a number where we feel certain that the patients that are coming in, first off, need to be there, and that the patients that come to the emergency department likely needed an emergency department visit. You know, our, our urgent care is so close, patients can self-select, um, and during the pandemic, we actually were able to uh, select for them, which we cannot do anymore, of course. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll let others ask questions about utilization. We won't take up too much time, but thank you for that. I'll just hop in. Uh, one of the questions that I had in follow up to the migration discussion and the reducing out of migration, it, I didn't get this from your narrative, but from the discussion today, it sounds like a lot of that focus is uh, connected to the DH affiliation. Um, so, Am I getting that right? So the idea is right now you're transferring folks to Albany or to another hospital. And what you're hoping is that with the DH affiliation, you'll be able to keep more folks in house. Is that really when you're talking in your narrative about the reducing the out migration, is that really the bulk of it or what am I missing? Tom, you want to take that? Yeah, um, Robin. Um, Albany will continue to be our, our major source of where we refer patients for. I mean, the proximity is, is much closer than DH. I think we're going to see more and more of elective work over time going to, to Dartmouth uh, for admission. But I, I would continue to say that, that Albany will be, the, will be the majority of that. Um, you know, I think the more we can keep locally, again, as, you, as the numbers that Sarah showed, the the costs outside of um, SVMC are substantially higher. And we think with the services that Dartmouth help, helps us create here with their support, we can, you know, that out migration number, and, 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 and the number is old, but I think the number was about $50 million of care leaves our region, leaves our area per year. Um, we think that, you know, Certainly, a portion of that, um, maybe you know, up to, up to maybe over time, one third could stay locally here, and it, and it could be treated at a lower cost. So, um, but the strategy with Dartmouth is to is to provide as much care locally, and uh, and hopefully we don't have to, um, you know, send um, as patients out and also send up to Dartmouth, and they, they really want to have the quaternary care, tertiary care patients. They don't want to have lower level patients, and, and we want to keep the lower level patients here in terms of the acuity. So that's kind of the strategy. Yeah, and, and, Robin, and Robin, Robin, simply also, if we improve access and patients that live in our service area that currently have a primary care patient, uh, physician outside of our service area, uh, if they can get into our practices, uh, they probably will uh, use our services um, uh, more. So, um, so th th that's all tied together. Kathy? Yeah, the, the one um, already apparent example we've referenced is oncology. We have many, many, many patients who've had to go outside because they couldn't get appointments for their treatments. They've gone to New York or Boston or Dartmouth, and now they can get those services here. And it's a huge deal. I cannot tell you how many Obviously, cancer is very prevalent. So many people have been so disheartened that they need to go outside because they couldn't get appointments, and now they can. So that's a very big deal. Yeah, to follow up on Kathy, it's, um, 
unfortunately, we, we've had two people in the finance department uh, uh, diagnosed with cancer that couldn't get in to see our doctors, and they had to receive treatment outside of uh, their where they work. Uh, so, uh, so now being staffed up, we'll be able to uh, um, they'll be able to see, receive their treatment in the future at our facility. Thank you. Um, Robin, the other, can I just, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course. I'm just going to, sorry, I'm going to jump in real quick. Granular yeah. answer to your question. I'll just use oncology since Kathy gave the beautiful example. You asked about DA. So first off, back to your original question. We're talking mostly about outpatient here, not not inpatient. That That's the, to, to answer that first thing. Then the second is, if we'll go with oncology, what we're saying is without that relationship with DH, our ability to be fully staffed is, is really not there anymore. Oncologists do not want to practice in a one and two practice anymore. They want to be in a larger practice where they can continue to do academic research and they have the support. You know, and that's unfortunately due to specialization. Um, they're even further specialized. So a, an example of this is in the past, first off, we can recruit more. Now, in the past, someone may need a particular type of chemotherapy for a short duration for a complicated cancer. They would go elsewhere and they would stay elsewhere. You know, they, they wouldn't come back here because what would be the motivation from that other place to send them back? We now already have patients that we, we do 90% of it. They need to go up for one or two special things. Uh, but then they they just get referred right back here and into the system where they, where they belong. Um, head and neck is a great example. Uh, they used to all go elsewhere. Now uh, head and neck cancers can stay here for the most part. They may need to get a little bit of debulking procedure at DHFC, and then they return. Thank you. And then just one more quick. I hope what I hope will be a quick one is. Um, Steve, you mentioned increased insurance denials. Is could you give us a sense of is that self-insured? Uh, MA plans, just any trends you've uh -oh. seen in terms of where that's coming from? Or um, is it just across the board? I, I would classify it across the board. Um, uh, United Healthcare has been difficult, uh, but we don't have that much volume. But when you look at the proportion of, of what we're seeing, and, um, you know, I, I think the real, the real answer is across the board. Um, Thank you. I think that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Other board questions? Dr. Merman. <laughs> I, I just, uh, thanks for the presentation so far. I haven't had a chance to comment or question. Um, uh, actually, I think I might venture just a quick comment, which is, um, you know, Dr. Dobson and I are both emergency physicians and we think about the admissions numbers. And over time, this has been used a lot through research as a marker of acuity, but it also seems to be a marker of bed availability. I don't think these numbers include transfers. And there's also an argument that, that you know, a low admissions number is an incredible amount of work that the emergency provider team has done to try to come up with a solution other than admitting the patient. So this is, it's kind of a complicated number that speaks to a lot of things, but I think it's an interesting number to view over time. But I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a very multifactorial heterogeneous group. Um, the questions I was going to ask the two of you, or the three, four of you, is um, when you were talking about utilization, um, one thing that's come up in the primary care advisory group and in other uh, situations is other information that we get is on um, available uh, visits in a primary care provider's schedule for urgent visits and sort of the complexities of trying to fill a schedule to make sure they get their visit numbers versus having availability so that you can get urgent visits in so that they're not having to go to an urgent care or an emergency department but can be seen by a person who knows them is it, how do you approach uh, open slots for uh, pcp visits for urgent visits trey you want to take that sure well, I can say, um, you know, not great. Uh, we've been working at it really hard, and that's what we've been doing over the past, you know, many years. But the last year, we've started to make some head roads. Really, when I say the last year, this this year, uh, January on, and it's by using data that we've um, verified and we know to be right on on an individual's, uh, the primary care physician or provider's schedule, so we can actually say, do we block off? additional time here or do we just double book and then not double book in certain times so right now we're sort of in an experimental phase uh dave where where we've looked at which practice is doing it the best which practice out of our six actual primary care including peds 
has the most availability in slots. And so we're mirroring that. And I can tell you in about a couple of months how it's going. Um, right now, it looks like that's part of the 5% increase we've seen over the past three months is by uh, getting urgent visits in. They do send people to our own urgent care, um, which is better than some other urgent care, because at least it's, you know, they know each other and it's in the same computer system, but it's certainly, as you point out, not near as ideal as getting them into their own practice. So some practices have availability in the morning or afternoon, extra slots. That sounds great. It might not be the best approach. It may be a better approach to lighten up the double booking and and go with that. So uh, I'll let you know. Lots of lots of work on it though. Yeah, I, I guess. Thank you for for the attention to the problem. And I I wouldn't venture to think that I could understand how to solve it. But I I um I really appreciate uh, your discussion of it and and your attention to it. Um, the other question I had for you, you mentioned in your narrative, um, some local independent primary care providers uh, retiring, some people leaving practice. Um, and I was just it, wanted to see if I could get an idea of what the landscape is for independent providers in your area, if there are independent primary care providers or other, if there are any independent specialty providers in your area. And if they work with Southwest yeah. on, you know, admission privileges or those sorts of things. Right, yeah, so they've, um... They just continue to dwindle. I, I would say that we now have about um, less than four FTEs of independent primary care, maybe maybe five um, FTEs. When I say that, because some of them are part time uh, left in the area, and that that's compared to probably 15 when I started. One of those is the FQHC that is up in it's in our health service area, but it's in Arlington, and that makes up the bulk. The rest are you know 0.5 practices where people are retiring uh, in 2023 and 2024. And one just sort of prematurely retired, unfortunately, due to some health reasons uh, this month. So um, as far as specialty, it's the same. It's very few. We have some oral maxillofacial surgery, which will probably continue to be private for you know many more years to, um, in, the, in the entire state. I think most of them are, except probably around UVM. Uh, and then ophthalmology continues to be independent practices. Of course, they're on medical staff. Everyone's very close. Most people don't know the difference uh, from that standpoint. Uh, it is part of the reason, though, that we need to get this uh, new practice off the ground pretty quickly where we're training advanced practice providers and then, of course, the residency program over time. Okay, thanks for that detail. Any other questions from the board? Um, I just have a follow up from Member Holmes's question on the potential to come with a with a rate reduction. Um, I wasn't really sure what the answer was, and I was looking at the wait time uh, report from 2022, and certainly SBMC was pretty high. So, in terms of Member Holmes's question, obtaining some of the NPR through utilization as opposed to rate increase would be uh, beneficial, I think. Um, and I guess I wanted to see what your position was on whether you would come before the board for a reduction if the utilization is higher than anticipated, um, because I think it makes it more palatable to accept the rate you requested. Tom, I'll let you answer that. Well, I, I think our, our position is uh, there, there shouldn't be surprises and we should come to the board based on <laughs> if our volume goes up quite a bit more or if our volume goes down. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, I, I see next the next 12 months as being very transitional and every program we're talking about really doesn't, doesn't come into place in 2024, it's more 2025 and 26. But, um, you know, hypothetically, I, I think, you know, we're open to those type of discussions. Um, but, um, so, but I think it has to be on, on both sides of the equation in terms of, um, significant increases or significant decreases and, and how we have to deal with that. Great, understood, thank you. I, I have no other questions. Any questions from the healthcare advocate related to utilization or the conversation so far? Hi, Director Lindbergh. Uh, thank, I just have one question, but before I do that, uh, so Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, just is the plan, Sarah, still to have questions that don't fit into these tabs come at the end? Yep. Okay, great. Um, 
so my question, I'm not sure if this neatly fits in, but um, in the narrative on page seven, you noted that outpatient revenues combined with the medical group represents around 81% of net patient service revenue. And I'm wondering if the partnership that you talked about with Dartmouth, do you expect to grow that percentage at all? Well, as, as, I, as I reported earlier, um, as we improve access and improve outpatient utilization, we will probably see outpatient revenues go up. But there's also a chance that mm -hmm. inpatient revenues, as we start bringing people back and, and in, into the hospital, into the inpatient area, it, that may go up. So the percentages may, when you start using percentages, while the absolute dollar may go up, the percentages may fluctuate a little bit. I do, I do okay. believe that overall, um, you know, we're getting to, you know, we're at 81% on the outpatient side. Um, it, it, it probably will ultimately long-term, you know, if I had a crystal ball, probably be between that 80 and 85%. But if we start getting some of those uh, services that out migrate to Albany and we keep them home, um, it may push that outpatient percentage down because inpatient utilization may go up as Tom just talked about. But most of those increases in inpatient, I believe we're going to be in 25 and 26 as we get the services up um, uh, and running and working more collaboratively with Dartmouth now that we're in, in affiliation with Dartmouth. So we got to be careful about okay. percentages. Is my is my sure. caution. I agree. Um, and you talked about becoming a regional referral center. I'm wondering if you expect, as that comes online, do you expect patients from you know states like Massachusetts to be referred? Like, is part of the goal to grow out of state patients, or is it more really reducing the out migration within Vermont? The first step is to. Um, improve the out migration or decrease that out migration um, if we can if we can get our tentacles out into New York State and bring back uh, patients uh, and improve um, our our volumes that will that will help the hospital that will help Vermonters because it will reduce the cost of care um, in in our facility because uh, we'll be able to spread that cost over a wider base because part of it, part of one of one of our challenges is is our size yeah. uh, and if we can get some more throughput uh, we can reduce the cost per uh, episode okay Tom yeah and just to add to what Steve said Sam I, I think um, you know you have to realize as, as we build services and programs I think organically you're going to see more people traveling to our institution for care because you know the areas of New York areas of the Berkshires I mean they, they there's a, a good relationship in terms of people not wanting to travel down to Pittsfield or, or down to you know Bay State Hospital for their care they'd rather come somewhere closer by so I think you'll see some of that happening but clearly the, the biggest piece we're going to focus on is other Vermonters living in Vermont here, trying to have them stay close to home for care. And that's a, that's, that's a, that's the huge amount of the $50 million I talked about earlier. That's out my brain. Trey. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, I just I'll put some granular um, examples here, you know, in the past community hospitals, haven't received patients uh, often. They don't typically have a good process to receive a patient from a lower uh, level of acuity or frankly from another community hospital that just doesn't happen to have a service. So let me just give an example. You know, having four or five general surgeons at every community hospital is, is hard on each hospital. They may not quite have that business, but what happens is you have patients that present uh, to NVRH or to uh, Grace Cottage or to some other hospital, and they don't happen to have that surgeon on. So in the past, those would go to tertiary care centers, and that's just really not the best, you know, way for us to all collaborate and work together. Uh, so SBMC uh, is trying to, like some other community hospitals, say, here's what we have. 
here's the phone number to call. Let's make this easy. If you have a patient and you don't happen to have that service that day or you don't ever have that service, and we do, let's take care of the patient here rather than in Albany or Bay State. You know, that's where these patients go uh, if they can't get into UVM or, or DHMC. Plus, there are call centers now with UVM and DHMC who are trying to do this by phone. They're trying to say, where can this patient go who happens to be at uh, – you know, at Brattleboro or some hospital that just for some reason doesn't have that service this day, let's do it in a coordinated way. And we believe SVMC is, has the size and capacity uh, to be able to take on these patients and provide that service again, rather than transferring them out of state, uh, which we have just seen is more expensive. Thank you, that's all from us for now. Wonderful. Um, so in the interest of time, I think um, if you could just give us a high level kind of the cost inflation spread uh, that you use for your budgetary purposes um, and uh, what proportion of that uh, kind of is driven by the pharmaceutical growth. So, um, you know, we used um, in the budget uh, four to five percent, depending on the commodity, depending on uh, what we're seeing um, in, in some of the contracts now. Some of the periodicals um, said uh, you should probably use a higher number. Some of the periodicals said you probably should use a lower number. Um, we feel that the four to five percent is um, uh, a good range. Um, we also we also historically have always tried to be a little tight on that uh, to create thought process with our managers um, so they can find efficiencies and create. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I've used over the past uh, 12 years at Southwestern, and I've used it over 25 years, is, um, and, um, is a, a software product uh, that is off the Medicare cost report and gives a lot of um, uh, information. Uh, the Cleverly Associates, um, they, they, they calculate a cost index. Um, and we've always strived to be better than 1.0 on their cost in index, uh, because below 1.0 um, on their cost index, uh, it's, um, that means you're efficient. Um, so we also look at that, um, and we've tracked that now for all the years I've been in Southwestern, uh, and we've made improvements uh, each and every year. Um, so using um, the, the philosophy of challenging our managers uh, not always putting full boat inflation into the into the uh, budget uh, has worked to create some efficiencies. But we got to always remember um, safety, patient safety comes first, employee safety comes first. Um, you know, I, they're one A and one AA. Um, so we can't jeopardize that. But we got to, you know, we we create a lot of creative thought process with our managers. So. Uh, overall, um, uh, that's our philosophy, and that's what we put in the budget. As for the pharmaceuticals, uh, we put a, a you know there's a, there's a 6.4 percent uh, increase in overall costs. Um, you know, uh, 340B savings and uh, a 4 percent price increase. Now that this is one area where we believe, um, and we've had a lot of discussions uh, collaboratively with the Dartmouth uh, pharmacy team that uh, we'll be able to uh, save some money, just not in 340B, but with uh, purchasing uh, other um, pharmaceuticals through, through some of the integration and also looking at our formulary uh, and looking at other types of, you know, going from name brand to generic. And, and I know Trey has been actively involved with some of our physicians and our pharmacy. Um, uh, department and he can talk a little bit about that uh, just in general terms, if you don't mind, Trey, on on the um, the differences between uh, name name brand drugs and and non name brand drugs. Yeah, well, mostly some of the opportunity there is on the monoclonal antibodies, you know, the infusions like the Remicade and the cost that is paid for those medicines. Um, you know, it's very complicated. Depends on the payer uh, and Sometimes it's the generic, and sometimes there's a better deal with the, um, you know, with the name, name brand. But what we have found out is that there's a fourth category there, and it allows for Remicade that's unlabeled as Remicade, but is made in the same plant under the same conditions, and not generic because it's made under the same conditions as the brand that's much cheaper. Um, and so that in itself is a significant cost savings. 
There's also opportunity, of course, similarly in oncology drugs, and that's probably the biggest opportunity. We won't be able to realize that this year. I think this is more of a you know nationwide approach, but also working with DHMC uh, to figure out ways to get better prices on oncology drugs. We I think everybody can agree on on that particular uh, aspect. Wonderful. <clears throat> and how do these inflationary pressures translate to uh, your uh, budgeted charge increases and the realized uh, commercial revenue off of those? So, um, Sarah, you know, what we do is, you know, we, we put our assumptions together uh, on the expenses and uh, and we look at everything and then we go back and we look at our, our, um, our revenue models. Uh, you, you, looking at inpatient, outpatient, you know, all the services, and um, and that's how we, you know, we build it and we build our target. Of uh, you know, this year we built a target, uh, making it a transitional year from a, a year where we lost money to a one percent operating margin, um, and and that's how we, you know, we build it. We look at the governmental payers, we look at all the payers and all the things we're doing to improve revenues uh, on without uh, putting uh, in on the charge increase. And, and this year, you know, we settled in on, on the charge increase that we, we requested, um, you know, and, and we all, you know, uh, in the narrative, we talk about that. We don't, we didn't increase all our charges uh, by that amount. Um, um, we, we're increasing uh, approximately 70% because there are some charges that, and taking the physician practices, all, all of our payments are pretty much off of the fee schedule. So why increase? Our charges are already higher than that fee schedule. So th there's no need to increase those charges anymore uh, because there's a delta already. And the fee schedule is only going up. And, and why keep increasing the charges? So, so we, we look at the sensitivity of our charges. Uh, we look at... Um, uh, I download uh, again from Cleverly Associates. I'm able to get uh, charges uh, off of publicly uh, data, and and we compare ourselves uh, more than once a year to what uh, people in Vermont are paying, what people in Massachusetts are paying, what people in New York are paying um, uh, on the charge level, uh, and we try to position our charges um, accordingly. And and there are some things that. Um, you know, we every once in a while have to do onesie twosie adjustments, but for every time we adjust one up, we bring one down when we find that we're high. Uh, and I think uh, three, four years ago, uh, we explained this at length at, at, in our budget presentation. So we're very sensitive to um, how we build our, our, our charge increase to commercial payers. Um, and, and, you know, Tom also talked about earlier in his presentation, our community groups will one of the things that we hear in the community groups, the cost of healthcare going up. Okay, and that and that's driven off, you know, uh, off of the commercial rate increase we get from the employers. So, so we hear that loud and clear. Does that answer your question, Star? That was a long-winded answer. Yeah, no, that I think that's good, um, and I do want to leave plenty of time for board uh, questions uh, related and HCA questions related to um, the inflationary assumptions and. Uh, price increases. Uh, but before I open it up to them, just two things we're asking all PPS or one thing we're asking all PPS hospitals is if uh, between when you built your budget and now we know that the Medicare final um, inpatient rate did go up a smidge from 2.8 to 3.1. Um, can you help us understand uh, how that affects uh, your budget? So, so it went up a smidge. As you, to use your word, uh, which is less than $150,000 on our budget. Um, and however, we have another assumption in our budget uh, related to the uh, Medicaid rate increase, which uh, did not get approved in the budget. Um, so they kind of, the, from a governmental payer's perspective, I see that as a push. I also see some risk possibly in the outpatient uh, area because the final rule for outpatient starting in January has not been finalized yet. So, um, you know, there's always the, the Medicare inpatient, the IPPS, which you just talked about, but we always, we sit around this August timeframe uh, and that usually gets approved later on uh, and is not always the same as the IPPS, um, the inpatient prospective payment uh, increase. So it's, it, you know, in, 
I don't want to sound, um, it's, it's almost a rounding error mm -hmm. in our budget. Um, yeah. So, um, but you know, it, it's another risk and maybe it's an opportunity, 150,000, but we have a risk for Medicaid of 100, I believe it's 140,000. Um, so, you know, they kind of negate each other and, yeah. and, you know, again, it's not uh, a significant number and, um, um, you know, I, Steve, I, I'm actually, go ahead. <laughs> Steve, just to jump in and Sarah, yeah. what is not a rounding error and which has us greatly concerned is the fact that we may lose our eligibility for 340B um, if we don't hit the, the, the dish numbers there. So that that is a, and that's something that we did not budget for. And it's a, it's a, it's a $5 million impact. So that is one that we are losing sleep over. And, um, and it's still yet to be seen as to how that plays out for us. Yeah, yeah, understandable. Um, all right, well, in the interest of time, we wanna uh, turn to our public comment in about 10 minutes. I would say this is a good time for board and HCA to ask <clears throat> other questions that you mm -hmm. would like to clear up, remembering that our decision will be mm -hmm. to establish a net patient revenue number in the order for fiscal year 24. Um, and to think about how that relates to the commercial price uh, to get there. So, um, board questions. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I, you've I got questions, AD. Okay. <laughs> I have nothing else. I have one more, um, which is around. Um, just understanding the Medicaid redetermination assumptions. I I think I saw in your submission that you are assuming some increase in bad debt related to the Medicaid redeterminations, uh, which makes sense if people are shifting from Medicaid either to uninsured or um, commercial. Did you have any assumptions around commercial since if people do manage to shift from Medicaid to commercial, the reimbursement rate will increasingly, will significantly increase. So, so Robin, we, we discussed with our, you know, we've been uh, with our charity care, financial counselors, whatever we want to call them, um, uh, staff. And um, when we were talking about how do we, you know, account for this and how do we, budget for this. And Susan, um, the person who's, who has most contact with the patients, uh, didn't believe that there would be a movement from Medicaid to commercial. Um, she didn't think the people that she deals with and works with, um, she's not, she, she didn't get a sense that many of these patients would be moving that way. And I got to go with her. She interviews these people. She actually goes to their houses. And uh, um, so she she was not really, she said, Steve, a big chunk of these people may end up in my office for, for bad debt, you know, may end up bad debt, financial counseling, uh, discounted services. Uh, but she didn't see um, a, a large percentage of those patients uh, moving up to commercial. Um, and the assistant director, uh, Jennifer Helfridge, uh, she, she, she had the same feeling. Uh, and she's my data guru. Um, and she says she can't recall. Um, now, granted, during the pandemic and the, and the uh, health emergency, there was no incentive. Uh, but she says, I, I don't recall too many even before that, uh, that people went off of Medicaid and became commercial. Um, that, that, is that, you know, for, sorry, Steve, is that because she thinks people just get lost in the paperwork? Because certainly if they're losing Medicaid because their income has increased, they should be eligible to potentially move into the exchange with yeah. a subsidy. She, so, um, she, she said, um, um, if, if I recall her conversation, she, she says, you know, yeah, there's a couple, Robin, but um, she, she wouldn't, you know, she, uh, their feedback to me was, don't do it, okay? Uh, and they're the line people. Uh, don't put any more money into commercial because you think a lot of Medicaid uh, people are going to move to commercial. You know what, Robin, there's going to be a couple, okay? There's going to be some, uh, but I don't think it's a material amount. Uh, based upon what they say. Um, 
and I got to go with them. And Thanks. they've been right. They've been right uh, more times than than I can I can tell you um, in my career. That's all for me. Okay. Sal, this is Tom Walsh. Um, maybe I missed it. Will you be um, covering the cost report tab? Yep, we can look at that now. <clears throat> uh, so Southwest uh, is a larger small rural hospital. <clears throat> um, and they, their case mix index is 1.4, so between the 25th and 50th percentile. Uh, this, I suspect, is uh, distorted by the corporate relationship, um, so I don't know uh, how to interpret that without some more information, but 36% would be on the whisker there. Uh, as far as cash, uh, from fiscal year 22, it was 11 million. Uh, they are moving some money around for that ED modernization Sarah? project. Yes. Yeah. Sarah, can I just interject uh, on, yeah. on ca cash for operations? Um, keep in mind, uh, as we outlined in our narrative, our day's cash on hand and the days and the cash that gets recorded on the Medicare cost report is SVMC's cash. Okay. Right. We, uh, um, we, the way we have our corporate structure set up, uh, we have cash um, in the parent organizations. Our investments are in the parent organization. So uh, we, we sit um, at about uh, 100, call it 100. Our goal was 190 days. It's probably not going to get there. Um, but um, so, so on the, using the cost report, um, it, it, I just want everybody to know that there's other cash available. And yes, we are also, we have a foundation that um, has cash and that is contributing to our, our, um, our ED modernization project. Um, and of that $30 million for the ED modernization project, uh, about more than half of it is coming from donor money. Um, so, um, you know, we, ha we have that, and I think that's in a couple of the other measurements. When you look at the total margin of the organization, um, you'll see that uh, the money coming in for that construction project, the accounting rules say you got to transfer it in, and, and it ends up uh, in the total margin. Um, so just just be aware of that. And, that. and that's all cash coming in from the foundation. Yeah, all okay. <clears throat> completely yeah, important uh, caveats. Uh, yeah. uh, profitability uh, for EBITDA per discharge right at the median. So that number for fiscal year 22 lower than people would ideally like to see. Um, and this cost per discharge is quite striking at 8,000, uh, which is below the 25th percentile. So um, yeah. that again is and a, a cost uh, calculated by cost center. Uh, CCRs. So, and 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 this data on the cost, uh, I paid special attention to this and compared it to our cleverly um, benchmarks, and uh, it, it it it's consistent uh, with what we've been using over the years. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Sarah. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to have to really a couple comments. Right. This is um, thank you for your your presentation to us and what you've described as your community focus and your addition of primary care service lines and mental health focus and substance use disorder focus is, is really outstanding. And thank you so much uh, for that. Similarly, the nursing team story was outstanding. Um, and the, the cost per adjusted discharge data shown here is also outstanding. But I did want to ask about the ratio of administrative and general salaries, because that doesn't quite fit the picture of the rest of your organization. Um, but this suggests that this um, proportion of, of salaries going toward administrative and general expenses is, is um, on the very high end um, compared to the um, money being spent on clinical care. And I was just hoping you'd help us try to understand. Yeah, Tom, I I have not been able to. I believe that's um, 
that's cost reporting um, techniques, and um, we can get back to you on that. I, I believe um, I, I was a little perplexed on that one as well. Uh, because we do spend more uh, on the cleverly information. We spend more on on clinical. This is an opposite of of what I saw on, on, on cleverly. So I think this is a work in process, and we can dive into that uh, and get Sarah a response that she can forward to you, because I, I think this is just a cost report thing. Um, right. Because and, I know from I, all the other benchmarks I look at, that's that's not the case. Yeah, it does. One... For your... Go ahead, Tom. Uh, um, for your organization, it's the piece that doesn't fit. Right? Yeah, it, it's um, so um, just helping us with it would be great. Um, and just one more uh, bit of kudos: um, your your um, staffing decisions, right? What we we see across. Um, you know, socially responsible hospitals across the country faced with difficult times. Um, they don't fill open positions. They reduce administration. They avoid cuts to service lines, all the things that you were describing earlier. And um, so just, uh, it's really been a pleasure hearing you. Um, and I'm thankful you've started us off. Thank you. Other questions from the board uh, that you want to have before we uh, say goodbye for this year? <laughs> I just have uh, two questions I'd love to ask. Um, one is in the capital expenditures, you have a $7 million IT infrastructure uh, upgrade. Is, is that to switch to Epic to align with Dartmouth or, or what's, what is that? So, so our, our $7 million um, uh, is our capital budget for 2024. That's our routine. That's the total capital budget um, for the organization on routine capital. That does not include the emergency room, uh, the completion of the emergency room project. Um, and of that, $2 million, uh, upwards to $2 million will be spent on IT infrastructure. And I would classify that in, in, in two ways. Every year you have to, uh, for cybersecurity and for uh, just IT, we need to spend money. And the second piece of that is going to be to build our infrastructure to be able to receive um, and, be, and, and utilize Dartmouth Hitchcock to move to Epic. Uh, but that's a three year, at least a three year journey. So just to repeat, the $7 million is our total capital budget, routine capital budget, uh, which about $2 million is IT. And, uh, you know, let's call it a million, million two will be for that infrastructure to move towards Dartmouth. And do you, do you have an estimated expense of that transition to Epic? That, that's what, what that's going to cost Southwest? That the the estimate uh, that we had the last estimate we have is, could be as high as twenty million dollars, but part of our relationship with Dartmouth is that we'll find uh, funding arrangements for that uh, outside of uh, the hospital. Interesting, great. Uh, the other question I have is a little bit more conceptual, which um, often when we look at hospital consolidations around the country, uh, it increases costs of delivering care, uh, increases insurance costs. Um, you talked a lot about the decreases in costs through affiliation with Dartmouth. Do you, other than IT upgrades, do you suspect increase in costs and how do you think you can manage avoiding that trap of so many other organizations? Well, it comes down to, you know, uh, paying attention to details. As Tom spoke earlier, the Dartmouth model is, uh, is a little different. And some of the, um, uh, I worked for two huge um, systems. One's a nationwide system and one was a system in New Jersey uh, before it came up to Vermont. Uh, and I can tell you that um, uh, Dartmouth does not um, utilize the same models that um, those systems um, did increase costs to the member hospitals. Um, and, you know, there, there are, Tons of examples of how costs are increased, but I think Dartmouth is very cautious on not adding cost onto the smaller hospitals 
And uh, we are focused on, in our budget, you know, we are focused on um, supply chain, reducing our supply chain uh, cost uh, by where the ability for us to purchase under their, you know, they buy they buy a hundred thousand of a widget, uh, and we buy a thousand of it. Well, now you know at a hundred one thousand, we can get a price a better price. Um, so we're focused on that. Um, cost of borrowing will be less. Fees um, around certain things that we do, we can reduce because there's there's more mass, um, and uh, we're committed to making sure that uh, and so and and I don't want to speak for Dartmouth management, but they're committed not to. Uh, burden us with uh, high administrative costs um, as other systems have done, and and we're going to manage that. Uh, Tom, you want to say something? Hey, Tom, yeah, yeah, just you know, um, yeah, um, David. I think um, two things as Steve touched upon. I think Dartmouth has a true focus on not building corporate overhead. Actually, in um, I mean, most of the systems Steve's talking about has very they have very large corporate overhead. Uh, and also to reduce administrative costs is another area of a focus that, that Dartmouth is talking about and, and we're talking about too. And the other thing is that in a lot of the system-wide um, managed care negotiations are centralized and that is not the case. Um, each hospital negotiates separately. Um, it's not centralized um, um, negotiations. And I think that's, you know, when you start having this, a single um, single signature on managed care contracts that's where you can start seeing costs going up too so uh, that's not the that's not the philosophy that dartmouth has in their system and their and our integration was approved uh without having that in place so that's that's another thing so and also the fact that we you know we are you know two hours away and so in a sense it's you know we have to be able to to run our operations and and i think that's going to allow us to to you know, focus very closely on the, the costs that we incur locally here. Well, thank you. Well, I, I wish the best of luck for all of us that that continues and um, we'll see it unfold. All right, questions from the advocate. <clears throat> Good morning, still barely. Um, <clears throat> Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, first off, I, I um, <clears throat> 100 caveats about the data we have so far about redeterminations. Um, May and June numbers were not typical groups. July's numbers we don't even have yet, but they were greatly infected, inf impacted by the flood. But we have, a, I just wanted to, in response to Member Lunge's question about movement of people to um, possibly to commercial, um, I guess I hope you're wrong, Steve. Um, so am I, so because, me too. Me too. Mark. Because we have a sizable number of people who are losing, you know, again, 100 caveats about the first couple of months, but, you know, 40% of those being reviewed. And remember, we're doing 200,000 through the year. So it's a lot of people who um, are moving off of Medicaid. And um, so I wanted to make that point first. Um, <clears throat> many of them may move back and, uh, you know, I shouldn't go down this rabbit hole, but I want to make that point. And then ask a question. I, I noticed that your, your bad debt, your um, uncompensated care generally has increased. Um, 22, it was in, uh, in the $7 million range and projected for 24, it's in the $10 million range. Is that is the answer to that question, the same answer you gave Robin about increased number of people uh, moving off of Medicaid to um, not being able to pay? Correct. You know, and, 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 you know, the other, you know, of course, price increase over the two years uh, has a factor in that number. Uh, but uh, we believe that that, that number, you know, we've, you know, I've looked historically, you know, when we have our, our meetings done on what the budget for bad debt uh, and charity care, with the with the staff that are on the front lines, um, you know, we look at our historical trends, what we said, um, what we and what we actually came in at. Um, all but uh, 2020, we were pretty much on target. Um, so, um, you know, I'm pretty confident that uh, we'll 
we shouldn't go over, but you know, the world's changing quickly uh, with this redetermination and, and it's a wild card, but uh, um, part of the team's uh, thought process was um, we are going to uh, see, see that increase. Uh, a, it's in price and B, it's in uh, some volume, but not a lot. Okay, your your ratio of um, bad debt to free care is in the three to one range, um, <clears throat> and um, we've held out a uh, an aspirational goal of um, uh, asking hospitals to uh, attempt to achieve a one to one basis. Um, do you have a concept of what it would take to um, to change that ratio? Take, um, you know, I, I kind of, and some people like this and some people don't, but there are, there are patients that will cooperate and work with us, okay? And um, uh, then there's patients that won't. Um, so, you know, improving and adding, adding staff uh, to go out and um, try to convince people, um, you know, it's, it's going to take, take some work. Uh, and, and right now, we don't see the return on our investment there uh, because at the end of the day, the people that will work with us will work with us, and you can't force them. So the people who end up in charity care, I, I wish everybody from bad debt would work with us because we can move them into char charity care or some sliding scale, okay, as, 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 the, you know, as our policy calls for. But um, it... Um, it, it, it's a difficult thing, you know. I, I, you know, I've been in the business, you know, and as Sarah said, I'm sunsetting, um, um, and um, uh, you know, I've been a CFO over 32 years, and, and I still haven't found the secret sauce to get everybody to to work with us um, and and turn that number from the bad debt to, into charity care. Uh, maybe the, the the you know maybe my secret sauce uh, wasn't any good I don't know, but uh, uh, we're working diligently to to qualify as many people as we as who who want to qualify, and I, th I think that's the difference. Um, in 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 you know there are people that that if they cooperate we usually can find them something sliding scale Medicaid you know you, you, we can get them into a program. Uh, but the ones that don't cooperate, that totally ignore us, that uh, is is the real frustrating part of it. So I, I think I, I won't respond to what's going on in people's lives that lead them to not respond or what impact that has on their ability to get care. I, you've heard me say that a hundred times, so I won't go yeah. down that road. But, um, <clears throat> but we treat everybody, but, Mike. But I, I will say, I think I think the question for me becomes, you know, what is different, what is happening different at different hospitals to lead to different outcomes here? Some hospitals are landing at a better ratio, from our perspective, a better ratio of bad debt to free care. And so I'll persist in asking that question at other hospitals, but that's okay. it. Um, yeah. um, and then my last question is, um, I, I think we may have asked this question in the past, and I don't know if you can help give us any uh, insights to it. Uh, in your bad debt category, um, um, it would be good for us to have a better understanding of what pay, you know, uh, how, to what extent those people are from the, you know, um, uninsured versus uh, commercially insured versus Medicare um, and unable to pay them. So um, I think what you're what you're asking, and, and we can dive down. You're, you're looking for you know how much of it is is true um, bad debt, true charity care, free care. Then how much comes from patients that have a high deductible plan uh, where they can't pay their deductible portion, and how much is coinsurance and deductibles? Is that is that what you're asking? Uh, no, not exactly. I would call all of it true. Um, okay, okay all of it. Yeah, yeah. But 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 I, I, I am particularly interested in, in uh, at this moment in the amount of Medicare uh, bad debt. Um, okay. um, you know, that's an area where I think we have some public policy options that I think you and the hospitals yeah. and the healthcare advocates office will agree on. Um, 
but it would help us to have some uh, insight as to the amount of bad debt that you, bad debt and free care that you have for people on Medicare. Okay. We can follow uh, up later. We can we follow up later. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Uh, I think this would be a good time to offer a chance for public comment. I remember what number I'm supposed to count to, 11, 20. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hearing none, uh, we'll just give Southwest, if you could keep your remarks brief, sorry to go over time, but just uh, any last uh, comments you wanna leave the board with uh, before we let you off the hook for this year. So Tom, before, um, before you make your final comments, can I make a final comment? Um, sure. I'd like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, you know, as Sarah pointed out, I'm, I am retiring. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to especially thank Sarah um, for, you know, this, um, I'll call it this tool. I, I think the tool has been um, a help. Um, we haven't totally dissected it, but, um, and I just want to thank the Green Mountain Care Board staff um, and the board members uh, for the years. Um, you know, sometimes it's been challenging, but um, it is, um, um, it, it's an evolution. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, board. And uh, keep this tool up, uh, Sarah. I think it will be helpful. You need to tweak it a little bit, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephen, for your service. And, and, and actually, <clears throat> Steve stole my, my, my closing comments. I wanted to thank him. Officially, too, I think he's done a tremendous job, and and thank the board. I mean, this is a it's a this is a tough year for all of us, and um, and uh, <clears throat> and we're entering into some un uncharted waters with our new relationship. But our our commitment is to continue to focus on our mission, our community, um, uh, and um, <clears throat> and we'll certainly be as transparent as, as you know as possible, and, and certainly. Um, try to reduce surprises and make ourselves available to sit down at any point in time to talk to the board and to update them, update you on where we are and and um, what the what the concerns are and what the future direction is. So thank you for your time today. All right, I think that concludes this hearing. Uh, I don't probably want to take it from here, Chair Foster. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you all. And, you know, congratulations on the forthcoming retirement. Um, and we appreciate the presentation. We'll take a break. We're going to take a full hour break. There's a couple of things board members have to do in between. So we'll come back at 107 and have a good day.